phase transition is a very important concept in science. In human lives also many a times there can be very interesting phase transitions including in careers. In today's Pratidwani episode, I have a unique guest and uh, the uniqueness of his life is that he was an erstwhile theoretical physicist but has made a very interesting transformation into quantitative social scientist. I am delighted to introduce you, my guest on this episode, Shivkumar Jolad, who is an associate professor of public policy at Flame University, Pune. His primary research interests are in social policies focused on education, migration and human development. He studies the structure of the schooling system, education policy and governance in India. He has also worked on gaps between language diversity and medium of instruction in India and uh, his other works also include uh, assessing the impact of COVID-19 on unorganized sector workers and uh, urbanization history of met metropolitan cities in India, etc. Uh, Shiv Kumar uh, did his PhD in physics uh, with a doctoral minor in uh, demography from the Pennsylvania State University in the US. Before joining the Flame University, he was a faculty member at the Indian Institute of Technology, Gandhinagar. So, with uh, no further ado, uh, let me uh, introduce you to Shivkumar Jolot. And this is Pratidwani, where we try to humanize science. Shivu, uh, whom I know from a very long period of time, mm -hmm. uh, is an excellent uh, scientist. And the interesting element about Shivu is that he is a physicist who turned uh, his attention to social sciences mm -hmm. and uh, has uh, really done very interesting work uh, in both the arenas, I, I should mention that. So, welcome to Pratidwani Shivu. Thank you very much, Pawan, for uh, introducing me and thank you for having me here. So, I have been following your podcast for a few months and many of the speakers are my own friends. I knew them professionally and to some extent personally, but I didn't know the human side and the science interest so deeply. So it was a pleasure to know their life history. Yeah. Too. Yeah. yeah. So we, we are also very eager to know about your uh, biographical history because the trajectory what you have taken as a scientist is very fascinating mm -hmm. and also motivating for people who would want to use their uh, quantitative viewpoints from physical sciences and apply it to uh, humanities specifically in terms of social sciences which where the quantitative elements sometimes are missing mm -hmm. and it can bring a fresh perspective and uh, you've done it very effectively so before we get into the actual aspects of your own research uh, could you please tell us about your biographical journey uh, from your school days how did you really get interested in sciences and uh, how did you approach sciences and uh, right from the beginning where it all started <laughs> your place and your, your time. <laughs> yeah, thanks Pavan. So, uh, I grew up in Bangalore. So, North Bangalore, I think pretty much the same place where you also grew up. Yeah. So, in Rajajinagar, Malayshwaram area. So, in my childhood, um, like I went to a school in Rajajinagar called Vidya Vadala Sangha. It's mm. a Kannada medium school. Nice, nice. Okay. So, and uh, that is where, you know, my science interest actually began. And before that, uh, little bit of family influence. Mm -hmm. uh, so, although my parents, they didn't study much, you know, they are not graduates, but my father has a very deep love for books. Nice. Yeah. So, nice. we had amazing set of Kannada books and occasionally some English books and also some books which are published in Russia and came to India. So mere was, publication. Yeah, <laughs> mere publication. Okay, okay. So, that was the time when India, Russia, you know, we had a very good collaboration and mm. we had magazines like Misha. Mm which used to come to us and then we used to read them okay. and uh, Tara Suvas, you know, tell me why there used to be some books, you know, which I used to read and in the childhood, uh, my father used to bring uh, some Kannada science books, you know, there is one uh, enc encyclopedia of science called Jnana Kosha, mm -hmm, okay, mm -hmm. which I think I read somewhere in sixth standard, mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. I was very intrigued at that time. It had physics, chemistry, biology, ecology, evolution, most of the things in simple Kannada. Mm. 
so i did uh, read that and there are other smaller magazines and even card um, like you know tinkle and all they used mm. to have science mm. articles which i really liked okay so and my mother supported me in all these readings by getting all the writing and other stationery materials and, and they all this encouraged me so that reading habit actually pushed me mm. into science to some extent and at the in school we had this amazing teacher called ramanand sir okay. so he was a great science communicator so he used to write poems in kannada about science for example about electricity you know its generation its use in kannada i totally loved that uh, the uh, <clears throat> loved those songs and then that kind of motivated me further and he also used to tell us how to do experiments at home using very low cost materials mm. you know mm. so like coconut shell and nails and uh, small bottles you can actually do the electrolysis of water mm. okay with some battery at home so my brother was also interested in science you know with him we used to do this you know small experiments at home okay and i that time i became a big scrap hunter mm. so uh, during those days like you know we used to have photo studios where they used to throw away some old film rolls mm. and uh, some old camera materials used to used to be there and then in glass shops we used to get uh, pieces of glasses and mirrors mm. in cycle shops we used to get ball bearings mm. Mm. so these are the materials which use which i used to take and then try to do some simple experiments you know so i still remember making a prism like structure just with you know a mirror mm. and a water mm. bowl mm. and it used to reflect and i saw the dispersion of light you know it was very joyous using cigarette wrap some paper wrapper you could make the capacitance guys <laughs> nice, nice so in that way earlier i was an experimentalist in some sense mm. so at least childhood <laughs> experiment so me and my brother we used to do lot of this scrap hunting you know kind of help mm. me further okay so and later as i moved to high school mm. so the interest kind of continued but uh, like some hurdle came because math was also becoming you know harder but i was not that good at math oh surprising because i should mention that uh, i am also classmate of you shiva was a star student <laughs> in fact especially in mathematics mathematics mm-hmm. i think you did very well right yeah, i'll tell you yeah story. yeah yeah. <laughs> yeah so in the a standard like you know, almost three times i failed in math wow okay so only in final exam i managed okay so so happened in ninth my father got me a book called conceptual physics by paul g hewitt so it's one of the most beautiful physics book for high school students mm. you know explained in extremely simple term and uh, hard bound colorful book nice i still wonder how we got that book mm. because he never had a physics background and he had not gone to like college or that but uh, he did get me that hard bound and mm. there was one more book called college physics mm. survey and fond mm. you know these were all hard bound american books you know got it Paul G. Hewitt's book was an amazing. I think it is in eleventh or twelfth Hewitt mm. edition now. Mm. Okay. So that he explained concepts in extremely simple, elegant manner with lot of cartoons. Mm. He only used to draw the cartoons, and even math equation explained in very simple terms. You know, of course, high school math. Okay. At that time, the second level book is the college physics book, which also showed that there is lot of math within that. Nice. Okay. Nice. Then I realized that okay, like if I really want to do some physics, you know, maybe I have to learn math. Mm. I was getting more deeper, <clears throat> more more interested in physics, and maybe in ninth I had decided I want to be a physicist. Wow! Yeah. Okay. Because thanks to Hewitt's book. Hewitt's book. Yeah. Okay. But the obstacle was math. Mm. So then, uh, in the holidays of you know ninth standard, I realized that I have to brush up all the math. So I read, did all the eighth, ninth, and tenth. Mm. mathematics textbooks you know at home so in uh, two months i kind of you know got some skills into math mm. and at that time there was also some math world kind of small school magazines that used to come for math you know i used to read those so that inter- generated more interest in math and my brother uh, was two years elder to me mm. so he was when i was in 10th he was in 12th Hmm. so i had access to his books uh-huh, uh-huh. math books so those books i used to read maybe i read calculus by then 
trigonometry, calculus. Those things I started doing in tenth. Nice, nice. So that kind of helped me to absorb this college physics, mm. uh, like a material. Mm. Okay. The Pongi I would give any very good conceptual background, and uh, this college physics gave some quantitative background into uh, like physics. Nice. And along with there are also the few other stud um, teachers who kind of inspired me in the school. So mm. I should also acknowledge them. Yeah. So then comes you know since I was so keen on this, uh, I also got to know that uh, there is this planetarium in Bangalore, mm. Jawaharlal Nehru mm. Planetarium. So they used to hold this science in action uh, every year, wherein school children could go and participate. Nice. And also nice. as an observer, mm. I went there. And I think one day I just landed up with uh, Madhusudan sir. If yes. You know him. Yes. Yes. Of course. Yeah. Of course. Yes. Yeah. So like I told him that I want to do this. Okay. So he said he was very keen. He was extremely soft, gentle person. Yeah. Very nice person. And uh, extremely motivating person. So yeah. he said, yeah, yeah, come and join planetarium. Okay. So then I also became part of the science in action thing. At I think one year later. Nice. Nice. Okay. At that time they were starting the series. Called uh, Black Hole Hunt, uh -huh. C V Vishweshwara, yes. C V Vishweshwara. Yeah. So he in this was in the time when I was in eleventh. So like Vishu gave the series of lecture on black hole, mm. briefly introducing general relativity, saying that you know there is interesting uh, math, uh, sorry, interesting physics here, and also talked about Einstein equation and all. You know this is all very fascinating yes. to me. Okay, so. Uh, and he also told us a few things like if you want to you know learn science you have to do it it's mm. not just getting fascinated so you have to work on it practice it okay. yeah. so those series were inspirational and after that the planetarium did this program for weekend uh, science lectures okay. nice yes so me Chandru, if you know, Chandru, yes, 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 and Padma, oh, Padma Leka, Padma Leka, okay. and then that person called Pentesh. Mm -hmm. We were all the earlier batch. So the first batch, you know, we started attending this regularly. Nice. Right. Uh, so there we had uh, eminent uh, scientists, let's say Bala Iyer, mm. Lokanathan, mm. sometimes um, even uh, IAC director Balram. Balram. And nice. He used to give some lectures over there. Wonderful, wonderful. Yeah. So this kind of uh, push me further, and at that time I was also trying to prepare for IIT. But in that mainly I was doing math and physics, mm -hmm. and I did this Olympiad thing, state yeah, regional yeah. Olympiad exam, and I think uh, that's where I met Vishwesha for the first time. First time. Oh, yeah. Vishwesha Guttal, who has appeared on the podcast before. Podcast, yeah. I should also mention before I forget that uh, the recent resonance edition mm -hmm. is on C V Vishweshwara. I very incident co coincidentally yeah. this week the resonance this edition week. which yeah. i am going to anyway link in the show notes hmm. actually is on cv vishweshwara who is a, a, a very renowned uh, black hole physicist mm -hmm. and uh, i am very uh, you know, fascinating person right yeah, yeah absolutely yeah. thanks that you reminded me of resonance because we also started subscribing to resonance ah, and nice. all the articles uh, you know in resonance and, huh. you know so i used to read that regularly yeah and along with that, I got this Halliday Resnick book, which I started doing. But I really, I really enjoyed that book. Mm, but mm. more than that, I got to know about Feynman lectures. Ah, okay. So yes. that is the thing which was a turning turning point. point. Yeah. Nice. Both okay. Feynman lectures, Volume One and Volume Two, mm. especially so electromagnetism. Electromagnetism. That book I did it in twelfth completely. Fantastic. Twelfth. Yeah, That's quite early. early. Yeah, quite early. Yeah. Because I was so fascinated with the way he was explaining. Uh, like an electromagnetism, like it appeared as though he is talking to me. Absolutely, uh, it absolutely. was so beautiful. Like absolutely, absolutely. I second your point completely. Hmm. And the other thing is also now uh, the whole series is also available online, mm -hmm. including his uh, uh, audio. Mm -hmm. ah, yeah. yeah, I think even the video part is there somewhere. But I, I knew the all the textual material was on. Yeah, yeah. Now I even the I think Bill Gates is the one who has really taken the initiative, uh -huh. and it seems uh, he has put it. And uh, yeah, it's it's been one of the most important uh, motivational physics texts for a lot of uh, mm -hmm. a lot of us. Yeah, mm. true, true. Yeah. Mm. So with that, of course, you know, then my resolve became even further. Mm. I'm not going to do any B Tech in engineering or anything. <laughs> so I wanted to do only 
physics you know but you know of course there is lot of parental pressure so coming from a lower middle class family yes, like yes. you know parents wanted me to be an engineer hmm. but i wanted to go to iit kanpur primarily for uh, msc yeah, yeah. integrated msc in uh, physics okay but of course i didn't qualify for iit like you know, for many reasons you know, mainly for chemistry hmm. which i didn't do that well so one reason is even chemistry later i found it fascinating yeah. but at that time maybe the books that i read was not the best and the teachers <laughs> maybe were not so inspirational yeah. towards that so it didn't happen so then i wanted to do bsc but uh, parents said no so then i got into isi kolkata i was doing bstat oh yes uh, yeah. yes you you went to isi kolkata i know yeah. i recollect that that is my intro to pure math mm. so i went to isa thinking that i know good math you know mm. by that time i knew calculus and many things yes. you know pretty well differential um, partial differential equations and all that but once i went there they kind of made me realize that you know nothing <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah so no before yeah. before we go into the isi part of it mm-hmm. you know i should also mention that the two years of overlap in my education with shivu mm-hmm. was in 11th and 12th standard mm-hmm. and i should mention that shivu was out of the chart student even then uh, because i recollect very uh, very well that there are a lot of people who were very good and uh, shivu was better than the very good uh, not because uh, they you could uh, get very very high marks and only that thing but he is his uh, knowledge of both physics and uh, mathematics was already acknowledged and uh, this is something very unusual shivu because uh, i also grew up in very similar environment like yours the pressure and the kind of uh, push uh, any st- any student has during that particular time uh, is to go into engineering and uh, sometimes you would not get this kind of exposure mm-hmm. uh, so are there very specific elements within your home uh, which really played a critical role in such uh, situations like uh, if there was something very particular from your parents uh, which really helped you to yes. go ahead one is book and they never obstructed me for studying this other books mm, mm. my like you know it is not that you should study only your course books of course mm. nice so when i asked for final lecture my father immediately got me the final lectures Very nice. so, you know he didn't ask a second question mm, mm. about these things okay and also during that time uh like planetarium they used to make us visit some places like uh, iisc yes like yes. we first time i saw electron micrograph you know that was fascinating, fascinating. for a student at that age absolutely Like, yeah so that for <clears throat> made my resolve firm and uh, so my father was still okay with it but i think uh, bangalore given the atmosphere yes. that it was primarily engineering or medical like yeah. everybody and also since i was in mes we both are in yes, mes yes so oh, everybody man. was becoming engineers <laughs> <laughs> like you know like there was social pressure to become an engineer yes yes okay. so so that's why you know maybe i had to write engineering exam exam an entrance exam no but uh, how did they allow you to go to for to b stat ha ah, b stat was still prestigious na isi ah, kolkata isi kolkata okay. and i had full scholarship ah, ah. you know everything was there and uh, all others so it is like iit for uh, math math exactly math exactly yeah okay. it's very very reputed mm-hmm. it's very yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. so there i did lot of pure math by ah, the way like ah. when i went to isi <laughs> so the first time you see mm. probability in a very rigorous manner mm. being taught real analysis mm. some of these courses initially i thought what is this you know <laughs> like it was very different from the physicist approach to doing science unreal analysis and for the physics it's an unreal <laughs> exactly for physicist it's mm. it's little uh, at a later upset. age i appreciate yeah, it yeah of course of course yeah yeah, yeah. Think, so mm. yeah so that part was there but my health condition was deteriorating mm. Mm. and also i want clandestinely applied for uh, presidency college over there oh. my parents did not like <laughs> <laughs> yeah so finally like you know i came back yeah. after almost a year oh. i think mm. okay then i wrote engineering mm. entrance exam again so i got a decent run not too high because cet i could score because math and all like it, it could be it was it was trivial for you yeah. <laughs> so in my 12th surprisingly my physics score was really low mm. like you know We we but were from the, the same batch, by the way. Yeah, in the yeah, same. Yeah, batch, yeah. You know? It was pretty low, but the thing is, CET score was high, so I could uh, get into get engineering, electronics, and communication. Yes, that I thought is the closest to physics. Yes. Okay. Initially, I thought I won't like engineering as much. Hmm. Hmm. 
but later i found that there are few subjects you know which are interesting in engineering, engineering also. Also. yeah yeah, yeah I, by the way i should mention during that time this time i also had another group which was actually motivating hmm. there is this pioneer academy, academy. Okay. in uh, bangalore hmm. so there there are a bunch of driven physicists like you know shrivatsa was in rri hmm. and ram who was in indian shock astrophysics hmm. issue students you know hmm. they were there but they were the ones who introduced me to landor and lifshitz series nice nice hmm. but they were at a pretty advanced, advanced level. Level. imagine i am coming at an undergraduate yeah. level but i see landor and lifshitz <laughs> and then i had to solve the problems at that level like you know it was a big gap yeah okay uh, so i did manage to do so during the engineering time i had a parallel self administered course on theoretical physics nice you know, what they nice. call theoretical minima landor yeah, landor yes uh, so i try to do goldstein you know griffiths mm. and landor's mechanics and uh, electrodynamics of continuous media, media. Yes. Yeah, like some of these books were favorites you know so i did as much as possible few books i did finish especially goldstein i love yes yeah. the mechanics mechanics mm. and of course griffiths mm. i totally uh, completed but still if you think about it i am doing a self study mainly in sitting in the rri like mm. uh, doing at an advanced level but i didn't have so much of undergraduate practice thing so that was a bit of challenge Mm. thing which i still miss especially if i had learned quantum mechanics at an undergraduate mm. level that would have been better but overall i did do those so that made my graduate life easier because when i did the ms in physics at texas a&m mm. mm. so they these courses kind of repeated repeated yeah yeah so then it was a smooth sail for me at yeah. many yeah. other courses over there yeah we'll come to that part before we we go to your us story Mm-hmm. uh now you are doing your engineering mm-hmm. see one of the very interesting things is that uh, you you kept your interest very high yeah. which is very important mm-hmm. especially once you have small drawback for example you had to leave the bstat program come back here start the engineering and you did very well in engineering too mm-hmm. and uh, in there uh, you how did you really keep your motivation high of course bangalore is a good place mm-hmm. because you, you you're in ms ramaya mm-hmm. i think yeah, exactly. close to exactly. iisc yeah. is that the reason uh, yes i chose uh, ms ramaya because of <laughs> what was it borders with iisc and rri library had yes, access yes. and thanks to shrivatsa and others yeah. you know i had regular access and planetarium i used to go regularly mm. so that was the best thing that the planetarium did yeah right later they formalized it into reap reap yes yeah, yes okay. yes so that helped many people to pursue science hmm. and many of us became actually you know phd holders at a later stage very nice very nice i think that is a key role like so you can conduct you know exhibitions hmm. to motivate people but uh, to sustain it you need a regular point of point of absolutely point right. yeah. absolutely yeah. so like and that was not just about lectures but they also used to go give us you know some assignments kind of things hmm. so few yes. problems to work yes. out yes. you know so for many people in bangalore doing bsc in science when their curriculum may not be great but absolutely got, uh, yeah reap was something they look for they for absolutely in fact uh, i'm very glad that you're mentioning this there are so many people who have vastly benefited mm-hmm. including me uh, because i was mainly inter- interacting with uh, uh, people in rri ji uh, srinivasan mm-hmm. ji s ranganath who also had another program which was kind of uh, mainly funded through isro Mm-hmm. they were there was a program on astrophysics mm-hmm. which was used to run and uh, you know what the the interesting element is that uh, all all the people at least most of the people who i knew including myself and uh, and also you uh, our economic background was not that great mm-hmm. but you know that is a distinct advantage of being in a place where science actually is done mm-hmm. because uh, science generally does not discriminate against people who may not have Uh, a higher economic kind of a uh, access mm-hmm. uh did that play a role you because see all, all the things even including myself i went to bangalore university for my masters mm-hmm. i paid only 4000 rupees per semester people might laugh now <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but you know that was the only thing we could afford yeah, exactly. to be very frank uh, yeah, and uh, these are all things which uh, generally we don't emphasize much because now okay we we are at a different kind of a situation mm-hmm. but uh, during that that stage this was a very crucial element right mm-hmm. yeah uh, and uh, is that something also you found very very beneficial during that time 
Yeah, absolutely. At that time, thanks to many of these government seats which you have yes, yeah, subsidized, subsidized so much. Absolutely, absolutely. Know, without which, I couldn't have done it. Same here. It's Same here. Possible. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And also, I came from Kannada medium uh -huh. yes. till age yeah. standard. So, Kannada medium. At least, I learned the science really well. I had no barriers in Fantastic. learning. In fact, I think Vishu also told this. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, in fact, it helped me to observe science better. Better. How? The childhood. How do, how do? How do? <laughs> <laughs> See, we are always switching to Canada. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Uh, so, in high school, uh, like you know, when I switched to English medium, uh, most of the science parts I could easily say through science and history. Yes. Yeah, yeah. It doesn't test so much of the language. Right. But, like, I was not from a convent, so I cannot speak the very fluent yeah. thing. And we didn't have the literary and the cultural and, background of uh, yeah. some of the upper middle class convent educated ones that I didn't have. Yes. But it didn't prevent me from learning science. You know? Nice. So, nice. like, you know, I could easily sail through. And also, writing skills were not so great because, you know, we were not trained in English, English. so yeah. much from the childhood. But uh, but science, thankfully, since it didn't pose that much barrier. So, that helped me move forward in science. Wonderful. Wonderful. Yeah. So, now, then, you are uh, finishing up your uh, your engineering uh, in, uh, in MS Ramaya in electronics and electrical engineering. Mm -hmm. And uh, what is going on in your mind? Uh, mm -hmm. What what is the pathway you you are taking to make a decision to go to to your PhD? Mm -hmm. uh, whom are you interacting during that time? What are your influences? What is your background reading during that particular time? Yeah, as I said, I was doing physics by myself studying. Yes, but the thing is, I also applied for fellowships. Mm. Indian Academy of Science. You know, they gave a fellowship, summer fellowship, yeah. in which I got to work with uh, Professor Rohini Goodbole. Oh, wonderful. Yes. Uh, yes. Like, you know, scientist, like yeah. amazing human being. Yes. You know? yes. Yeah. So, with her, I did advanced quantum mechanics kind of stuff. At that time, of course, fascination was initially with the particle, particle physics. physics. <laughs> I think with most physicists either have particle physics or astrophysics. astrophysics. Physics, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. But I think I started with particle physics, nice. You know, nice. which I was very fascinated. But I did that, but uh, later people were also saying, please explore other fields also, don't mm. just be stuck to particle physics. Oh. Th so, you know, statistical mechanics is interesting, yes. mechanics is interesting, optics is interesting. Yeah. Yeah. So, then in another year, I got a CTS fellowship, Center for Theoretical, theoretical Science. Science. Yes, yeah. yes. But this time I worked with uh, Professor Vasan Natarajan. Wow, okay. Yeah. He's an experimentalist, experimentalist par excellence. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. I went into lab. Nice, nice. Umakant Rapol, that is when first time I attained Ayan Banerjee, Umakant Ayan Banerjee in the yeah. water. They were setting up the lab. They were the first pioneers yes. in uh, optics, uh, quantum optics experiments yes. in, in India. Yeah. Like, you know, Vasan was there, he was guiding me. And I was seeing all these experiments, you know. I was working on this EIT, Electromagnetic yeah, oh, okay. Transparency. Transparency, EIT, yes, yes. You know. Wonderful. Yeah, I did derive certain basic. Uh, some basic equation, line width formula and all those things. You know. nice. I was given more theory part, uh -huh, uh -huh. but I was observing how the experiments are conducted. Kind of, kind of, so, nice. so, got great respect for experimentalist. Then, you know, yeah. The precision yeah. thing that I have to do, the number of years the Indian <laughs> scientists have to wait yeah. to get the results. results yeah. Zuma Kant you know, yeah. uh, is a living example of yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so that, both of them kind of, you know, helped me. Uh, to decide what to do after this. Mm. So I wanted to do PhD and most people said that you should do abroad. Take it. Then I asked these people on mm. and you know where all should I apply. So he gave me a bunch of universities and uh, Saroni Godbole, she also gave me some university. And I also researched and applied to a couple of places. And at that time I resolved that I want to do quantum optics. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. So mainly in um, Texas a &M, we had this Scully and Zuberi. Zuberi, yes, yes. Yeah, yeah it's a very famous, famous group. group yeah. Right? Yeah, I applied there. Huh. And wasn't recommended. Nice. So, thanks to that, uh, like, you know, I got there. And Zuberi actually took me. Wonderful. Yeah. Actually. yeah. And, yeah, that reminds me of Wasn't a lot. Unfortunately, he's no more. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Very unfortunate. Yeah, he, he's no more. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Yeah. So, then I went there. Mm. But I think his group, um, quantum optic group was largely full and there are a few things that happened. Mm. So, yeah, this is the next step, let's say. I got in there mm. and then I moved to US for my master's and PhD yes. over there. You know, that is the next phase. Next phase. Nice. Yeah. Nice. 
So at this time, like um, I had all high dreams that you know I want to do physics only, like mm. quantum optics, or I didn't know much about condensed matter theory, mm. uh, statistical yeah. mechanics. I had studied a bit, but I did not have a great feel for the subject as such. Okay, yeah, at Tamu as it is called, oh, it's yeah, name yeah. yeah. So it was a very big university, and first time you know I'm transitioning from an Indian university system to a no, American, yeah, American system. Yes, yes. I would say Indian college to mm. an American. Yeah. So mm. there is a wide difference Mo between these. Two. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. So in my engineering uh, college, uh, I was doing electronics and communication. I was largely focused on communication mm. subjects, mm. but I wanted to learn few subjects. Let's say fluid dynamics. Mm. Mm. But since you are tied to a discipline, mm. I could not do even that course. You know, okay. within the engineering, also doing a different course was, was not, not possible, possible. Mm. because. You are, you know, you are tied to your own discipline and no other exams yeah. are possible. Is that changed now or? I, uh, I right. think now it has changed. Now it has become a private autonomous university. Now mm. they do give us uh, options. Oh, major, good. Minor good. Options, yeah. you know. I think it has changed. Okay. Several places, but for a long time, I think you also been in the same system. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You are right. It's very rigid. Very yeah. rigid, you know, and for so non-engineering, forget science or humanities yeah, kind yeah. of subjects. You know, they are really far, far off. Far off. Far off. Okay. Exactly. Yeah. So this was unlike uh, IIT, for example, you know, Vishwesha when he went there, yeah. IIT Kanpur, he did take around six to seven uh, yes. humanities courses yes. and uh, non-physics courses. You know, he has taken a lot, but that opportunity we did not have. But once I landed in US, you know, I started this seeing this vast university, in which uh, thousands of disciplines are there. Okay, forty-five thousand is the enrollment. Oh man! Yeah. <laughs> at that time but now it is even more mm. so the first for the first time i am seeing people who are doing non science engineering and medical field nice so nice here i get to meet like economists sociologists nice. uh, and some art education so all these people from all around the world and they nice. are there and they are thinking differently they have their own career path yeah so this uh, first Shock about the world, like you know, it is much bigger than what right. I thought, <laughs> and more diverse than that. Yeah, wonderful, wonderful. So, is that also the seed where you are now getting exposed to social science, or is there a little bit more, uh, or rather, that is the first point of contact where you are getting exposed to this uh, humanities? Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, how was your thought process? Because see, generally, conventional education in India, especially if you go into sciences, at least in uh, 1980s, 90s, during the art times, mm -hmm. did not have you. It was almost like a complement, right? Mm -hmm. If you are trained in science, you almost had a very, very less kind mm -hmm. of exposure mm -hmm. in in other kind of uh, subjects. Mm -hmm. Except maybe if you go into places like MES for BSc or something. Where there is a little bit more commerce and, uh, arts. Co uh, commerce and arts. The arts was outstanding, to be very frank, That's because right. I did my BSc there. Mm -hmm. The languages was, you know, there like Srinivas Murthy and uh, wow. you know, there are so many mm -hmm. very well known literature people wow, who were there. Right. Uh, but I did not find that up to 12th standard at all. It was very bad. In fact, my yeah. my <laughs> my experience in 10th, 11th, 12th was hopeless, <laughs> to be very, very frank. Yeah, it was very rigid. Yeah. Hopeless, and then we were not allowed. Say all the courses we are to do only well in the science subjects. Exactly. Because that is what used to give you know entrance exam yeah. and all they used to count. Humanities were totally neglected. Uh, yeah. So and also people who chose humanities were always looked down upon. Yes, yes. You there know, was a you, stigma against okay doing BA. So that means you went. There was even a serial made. You remember Danda Pindagado? Danda Pindagado. Yeah, that was so demeaning. BA, BSc, BA, BSc, B com whatever again. <laughs> that was hopelessly. You mean they, they, people should get sued to really do that that kind of stuff, but yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So that kind of environment yeah. grew up. Yeah, in. yeah. And here I see that you know there is no disparity. Yeah, yeah. Like you know they are also doing well. Yeah. Like you know they are also respected even doing people doing literature, Absolutely. sociology, and all. Like you know, so there is no discrimination about the different, different. knowledge branches. Okay, there. Salary structure after yeah. this, that may be different, but the thing is, while studying, there was no discrimination. Discrimination, yeah. and Americans did not put so much emphasis, you know, or uh, emphasis, or maybe they didn't uh, place some fields much higher than the others. Others, 
so generally they have a kind of equal uh-huh. kind of uh, emphasis on all all these things yeah. Yeah. far lesser compared to india compared to uh, india yeah okay. yeah at that time like you know uh, i got exposed to these people i started discuss so she uh, then uh, uh, this transition might also be interesting because uh, the uh, environment is very different also in terms of weather right mm-hmm. <laughs> what was your experience there weather wise i would say texas had a mixed weather in summer it was hotter than bangalore oh like oh that okay <laughs> nice nice in yeah. winter it was cold but oh. not as cold like uh, snowy right no, no. but it was pretty cold uh, mm-hmm. and uh, it's a huge university like thousands of people mm-hmm. first time you interact with uh, people from all over the world nice so it was a very rich cultural experience you know and also our teachers were also pretty varied we had russian faculty like wow. american you mm. indian mm. like you know huge labs so like you know, yeah that kind of opened me up to the for world. also few basic question i started uh, asking when i was in us no. you know so main thing you know for the same kind of educational level like people in india were getting far less salary you know salary and the living condition much poorer uh-huh. mm. than that of the us nice like why is there a chai wala in india versus a, let's say coffee oh. uh, vendor in us and the oh. quality of life is very different very very different very different no. oh. this is a like you know this is a very simple fundamental question at that time i did not have any deep mm. insight into this nice. nice so i started probing into it deeper mm. so mm. how is it at that time thanks to internet mm. and wikipedia all those oh, yeah. things had come up so i could search here and there and try to understand a bit This was what 2004, 2003. Ah, uh, 2003 to 5. 3 to 5. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah. Okay, nice. And at, in Texas, and we also had a group called AID, Association for India's Development. Yes. yes uh, no. AID had multiple chapters in US, and Tamu had its own chapters. Nice. They, we used to actually get proposals from NGOs in India regarding education, health, livelihood, women empowerment, and all these areas. and we used to look at those proposals and then fund them nice okay. nice so there you know i got exposed to a lot of social issues during that time social and, and then we wanted to address those in our own manner mm-hmm. at least to give them funding to address th- those in india okay so then that kind of triggered my interest in social science until then i had no background in any of this no economics economics i had heard primarily from my father a little, little bit nice we nice. did not have any details in our Yeah, yeah, exactly. No sociology, nothing. Yeah. Imagine coming with zero social science background. So, and also childhood, we were not exposed beyond STEM disciplines. I didn't know people working in law or other disciplines, right? Mm, yeah. Social science disciplines. But this is the first time, you know, I did get to see them and chat with them over informal, informal. Chai, over beer, you know. Nice. So that informal conversation kind of triggers a lot of interest. Lot of interest. Know, so, and then you pursue it further. So. Okay. as we sip our tea uh, i would also want to know uh, the adaptability aspect of it uh, is uh, is that uh, you are also going from an environment which is slightly more you know um, i'll not say insular mm-hmm. but generally you know the emphasis is uh, that you should become an engineer mm-hmm. and uh, if you are also making a move to us the expectation is that you might actually become a software engineer oh, yeah. settle there Mm-hmm. when you were making the move was there any kind of uh, mm-hmm. inclination towards that uh, yeah many were thinking that i will go there and settle so, down there mm. and earn a lot of money that was what many of especially my family, family members yeah, thought yeah generally that is the notion okay, because first time somebody is going abroad and to university after that they'll get a big job yeah, no? yeah. the expectation but i think i defied all those <laughs> <laughs> good good for us yeah. in the sense yeah. and i was pretty Kind of said that I want to be in academia. Academic. I had no special interest to stay in US also. Oh, interesting. Okay. Also, yeah. I had no special interest. But um, I was learning a lot, you know, primarily from the <laughs> teachers over there, and also research was pretty interesting. Uh-huh. So uh-huh. initially started with quantum optics, uh-huh. Uh-huh. but there was also a teacher in statistical physics, like you know, Glenn Annolet, uh-huh. uh-huh. like, you know, one of the greatest teachers I've seen in my life. Nice. So amazing course on statmet and thermodynamics, you know, and he also talked about phase transitions, continuous, discontinuous. I still remember many of yeah. these lectures, you know. 
yeah that kind of influenced me a lot you know to choose condensed matter physics and statistical physics you know uh, later you know and yeah so then i applied to penn state uh-huh. you know so at uh, this time you know i had was there a reason why because you went only for a, a, a ms to texas uh, no, a&m uh, uh-huh. okay. like i went there for phd uh-huh. but there was some clashes with the advisor uh-huh. in my masters time okay okay we did write or uh, work on a few papers but mm-hmm. i think uh, my name was not oh. included initially then i had to go and talk to the dean mm-hmm. um no and finally it was there i worked on this superfluidity in solid helium this, yes yes yeah it was a very very big, big thing yeah. yes there was an experimental discovery yes. that there may yeah. be superfluidity yeah. in the solid helium yeah. and you were trying to do some theoretical calculations on nice. those things yes. you know? okay. that was my first paper actually yeah so that i worked yeah and uh, uh, like then i said you know maybe i should move out this is not the best place for mm-hmm. me mm-hmm. I, and <laughs> realized but and then i applied to different places mainly i got into penn state mm-hmm. so to work under jainendra jain yeah yeah he is a very well known name jainendra jain right yeah jainendra jain so uh, like pretty well known among indian american scientists yeah, yeah. and uh, like you know mainly works on quantum hall system fractional quantum hall effect mm, so mm. he has his own theory called composite fermion theory in the quantum hall yes, system yes. like you know which he pioneered and the i think quantum hall fqhc as we call mm, mm. so it also got a nobel prize yes yes and uh, that was for a explanation of one of the quantum hall mm. um, like uh, like system like one third as we call mm, mm, yeah what the fraction one third fraction mm. but uh, jain had generalized it to all type of fractions at least a broad class of fractions yes yes it's one maybe but some people say that he should also have been included mm. in the yeah yeah novel and all okay yeah uh, so then i was making this transition mm. from let's say texas a and m to penn state okay so and that was uh, initially it was smooth because i had already stayed in the mm. Mm. Uh, us for 2 years east coast was a fresh uh, mm. breather so it, east coast in us is much more liberal yes cosmopolitan mm. you know so that uh, kind of gave a much more enriching atmosphere over there in penn state nice, nice. and in penn state i met some amazing set of people mm. so mm. with whom we used to have late night chats on various issues you know sometimes it starts at 7 <laughs> PM and ends at 3 AM. Wow! <laughs> Those informal beer conversations actually <clears throat> triggered a lot of uh, change in your own interest. Yeah. Yeah. Now it is here that I start thinking of doing more formal studies in social science. Oh. Okay. So I start uh, reading UN Human Development Reports and works of Amartya Sen, Development as Freedom. So nice. Classic work. Nice. Okay. So Amartya Sen, John Dres. John Dres. Yeah. Yeah. so their work kind of inspired me a lot mm. to understand mm. development in detail okay? mm. and i also used to read lot of online uh, blogs mm. on uh, developmental issues in india okay? but what triggered the issue because i'm very very curious you know this is actually the one of the crucial elements of your biography mm. because with such a strong inclination you're talking about fractional quantum hall effect mm. you know which is actually one of the pinnacle problems in condensed matter physics mm. and uh, yeah, i see that uh, the jainendra jain's group actually is still you know digging in deep mm-hmm. and really uh, looking at that problem in, in greater and greater detail uh it is interesting that you also are in this frame mm-hmm. where you're really looking at quantum physics mm-hmm. and uh, and you're also looking at the social aspect of <laughs> the so called socio physics something kind of thing but how how was this because you know uh if somebody is also uh, wanting to really look at these kind of very totally uh, disconnected problem mm-hmm. at least in terms of research mm-hmm. uh how, how what was your thought process during that time i know it's still an initial stage we'll come to the more mature stage mm-hmm. later on but what was going on in your mind because the exposure in the university played a critical role there yeah 
so one thing initially i didn't think of connecting these fields at all okay okay, okay. Mm -hmm. it was independent i was more interested in the developmental issues no. so i mm -hmm. wanted to make some difference in mm -hmm. india yeah. i was looking at problems of education in yes. india yes. healthcare in india yes. that kind of uh, <coughs> triggered me ki you know maybe we should do something about it yeah and uh, working with uh, aid india mm. penn state chapter association for india's development mm. and we also had asha for education mm. so which was working on education in india mm. and we used to look at government bills the right to education bill actually had come out and mm. then uh, we were looking and analyzing those things i was part of those groups mm. okay? nice nice so those things actually triggered deeper interest in me but i had no thinking that okay these two things should be related, related. so mm. particles uh, you know so like kind of physics was kind of indifferent, indifferent. to happening mm. in the society mm. okay physicists may be keen on mm. you know developmental issues societal issues but physics as a discipline itself largely yeah. was indifferent, indifferent to, to things so what i felt is in if i just study only physics i will not be able to do much mm. towards the society mm. so mm. that was my thinking at that time mm. so i said okay maybe i should study it uh, independently a bit okay. nice so nice. that is when i was reading a lot mm. during that time 2005 to 2008 mm. Mm. and i also thought of doing a minor in um, or a masters in economics over there mm. Mm. but given the credit limit you know i mm. couldn't take so many courses mm. that would impact my research research yeah okay yeah. so i had to take limited number of courses they did not have a minor in economics mm. so then a closer one was demography demography yeah mm. that is something really caught on me so mm. i knew about population population dynamics you know uh, i said okay let me do a doctoral minor in demography what is doctoral minor uh, doctoral no that is like something <laughs> minor is usually like you know secondary you have a major field and oh. you have a minor field doctor minor is like during the doctoral program mm. you are majoring in one field mm. but, uh, like in physics let's mm. say but people may do something in material science mm. that can also be a minor okay okay but here i took a very different minor minors yeah, nice. where only social scientists were there mm. Mm. so thankfully like the university system allowed for it mm. Mm. okay so they did not have any restriction on it if you were interested you can do wonderful and thanks to my advisor jayendra jain who supported me excellent to do you excellent. like he didn't say ki it is very different from mm. physics you should not do it you know so he never said that but as long as you are doing your physics mm. work you know i am mm. fine yeah. with it yeah wonderful so that flexibility really mattered that still is unheard of yeah. even in our current indian system yeah. i don't see many systems kind of giving this kind of leverage right for especially at a doctoral level yeah exactly Uh, undergraduate level they do yeah undergraduate yeah. now it's still mm. much better now much compared better. to what it was yeah at doctoral level very few programs in india absolutely have it in fact in india when you start doing research you are already so specialized you go to an institute mm -hmm. which is doing working on same thing like indian stuff astrophysics is focused on exactly. astrophysics exactly yeah yeah and uh, you won't have that opportunity opportunity yeah but being a university system over there in us which had hundreds of schools uh, i could Hmm. actually do this i was also keen on education i took a graduate level course in education policy and politics nice that nice. was very intense first time i had to deal with uh, every week you know you had to read around 60 to 80 pages hmm. Okay. Hmm. the difference between science you know in science is in physics let's say yeah. four pages prl will be extremely condensed, condensed. <laughs> <laughs> yes yes sure each paper will be 40 50 pages yes. You know? very very good kind of coverage of every background yeah very nice. yeah it was pretty intense mm, mm. first time i am doing that mm, mm. thankfully i did it well mm. because i was interested in it okay so but it was a challenge mm. demography uh, i took courses fortunately many of the demographic methods are they closely align with the sciences mm, because mm. there is a formal structure to how the population actually changes mm. there are certain vital forces fertility mortality migration mm. so there is some mathematical structure to it so that i really enjoyed mm. so in that way i did the basic demographic methods and advanced demographic methods so like which had lot of math mm. and my physics and math training really helped yeah, i yeah. could uh, <laughs> like i kind of talked in yeah. that you know nice nice yeah so especially these courses but there you know 
One is the methods, but then its application to societal mm -hmm. systems mm -hmm. was also there. Social demography, where again I had to read sociology papers for the first time. Okay, this is when I get exposed to sociology, political science, you know, all mm -hmm. these fields. You no, know, I'm reading mm -hmm. academic works in that field. Okay, wonderful, so, wonderful. Yeah, and parallelly I'm reading some developmental literature mm -hmm. uh, elsewhere. And participating in some of the debates over there mm. online, there at that time there was a lot of activism going on, and uh, we also created certain forum like uh, for voting rights. Voting rights. I remember this mm. because I got an email from you from the US, uh. Uh, and I think I, uh, I I was probably also in the US or somewhere. I don't recollect when. Mm. Uh, but I I very vividly remember an email which you sent where mm. I if I am correct you can correct me. Was that you were trying to look at the fact of uh, people getting voting rights who are not present in that particular exactly, place, yeah. so, which is still not there uh, in India, by the way, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. So one thing like NRIs, if mm -hmm. you look at it, they are outside India. So, but they are not citizens. Many of them are not citizens of US. Exactly. I was not a citizen of yes. US. I couldn't vote in US. Exactly. I couldn't vote in India. It's a loss of vote, loss right? Of, okay. I'm totally different. Disenfranchised. disenfranchised. Okay. Precise. Whereas US fellows, they could do a postal ballot. Yes. Let's say US embassy folks are in India. Oh, they oh. do a postal ballot vote. In India, it's almost impossible to do that. Yeah. Yeah. So, voting rights were not there for Indians. Mm. For, sorry, NRIs, right? So then we created this group called Voters Without Borders. Mm, mm, okay. mm. Me and Nar Narhari, one of my yes, yeah, yeah. and uh, Vikas Argod, and mm. we three of us, you know, we kind of sort together. Okay, let's create a campaign. Nice, nice. You know, Voters yeah. Without Borders. So that we wrote a nice petition. Yeah, yeah. Got a lot of signatures from across the world. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then we went to the US Embassy uh -huh. in Washington, DC. Yeah. We submitted to the ambassador. To, to Indian ambassador. Indian ambassador. Wonderful, yeah. wonderful. Uh, so that was a great experience. Fantastic, fantastic. But you know, that ambassador took it very seriously. I totally understand these things yeah. and conveyed to it. And then this issue was discussed in the Pravasi Bharatiya Divas. Oh, wonderful. Like, right? Wonderful. There was some other group uh, also who worked on it. But you know, so it was discussed. But they did give some kind of voting rights, but it is not like an electronic voting or mm. a postal ballot. It's a very complicated, complicated. route. Yeah. You know, although NRIs in principle can vote, mm. but in practice, is still there are a lot of barriers. Barriers, yeah, yeah, you're right. But what we had proposed that okay, we should since we have our documentation of uh, being Indians, Indian passport is yes, there yes, with the thing. We should at least vote with the embassy over there. Embassy over there. Okay, mm. we just give, send our votes to the embassy. Yeah, all these petty you know suggestions were given, and we did. Yeah, so that is maybe my first mass my, very <laughs> uh, nice involvement in this. Yeah. <clears throat> so in that sense, you know, this is uh, this is a different kind of education for you, right? Because yeah. you are still doing your uh, your your uh, quantum uh, condensed matter physics, mm -hmm. and uh, probably also attending conferences in mm -hmm. the same stream, mm -hmm. and uh, simultaneously also in this boat <laughs> where you are also trying to. US system does give a leverage in mm -hmm. that way. I should really mention that. Their strength is that their universities actually are so yeah. kind of open, although there are a lot of problems nowadays <laughs> which they are facing. But uh, overall, the kind of freedom you get as a as a person mm. who wants to educate herself or himself mm. is tremendously yeah. good. Uh, in at that particular time, are you also interacting with people who also are in similar kind of situation as yours, where they are, let's say, who are in the background of sciences? Mm -hmm. But who are very deeply interested in uh, social sciences, or uh, were you the kind of person who was kind of uh, a, a, an outlier in this this sense? Mm -hmm. So there are two kinds of people in this. Those who are doing science want to do something for society. Society, yes. There is an action part of it. Uh, yes. There are many people who wanted to do action. I was also keen on action. Mm -hmm. For that action, you need to be on ground. Ground, yes. Okay. So I knew people who quit their. Uh, like masters uh -huh. or maybe completed masters, went back to India or quit their PhDs, went uh -huh. back to India, worked in village uh -huh. uh, for some time or worked with NGOs for decades, decades. you know. So they dedicated their life. You know? Nice. I nice. also had that vision, maybe I did not take so much drastic uh -huh. steps. Yeah. Okay, yeah. I didn't take that much. 
so they take that road where they through action they learn about society nice okay. nice so i was observing from a back end right. but i was doing more of the academic aspect ah uh, yes so through aid i was doing like you uh. know uh, supporting the action world uh, in development mm. but uh, background i was uh, like in you know, studying mm. social science i thought okay i should formally do something in this field yeah but the thing is as you progress in your career especially mm. with phd and all you become very specialized mm. outside world start seeing you as a specialist specialist yeah yeah if i say i want to do a like you know something in social science you know they would say no you have a phd in physics. exactly exactly why do you want to mm. do mm. this and you are over qualified for many other exactly things. exactly yes my yes. problem i was ready to start a lower end jobs in social science you know yeah. Just give me an opportunity. Wow. Okay. Okay. Uh, let's say you and I want to do intern. Oh. Uh-huh. They say that you know you are uh, PhD uh, in physics, but uh, I don't think we can give you a equivalent position. So that became a huge barrier. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. It's a it's a very interesting situation, yeah. right? People who are very qualified who want to contribute, there is a barrier here. Yeah. Mm. I said, what's I also have the skills of a master student. Yeah. Yeah. Right. I can do. Lower level stuff also, whatever you yeah. consider as lower, I don't even though I don't consider it as yeah. lower. Yeah. But uh, that became a big problem in the job market. Interesting, very yeah. interesting. Uh. So the only other option is totally jumping into the field. Ah. Uh. Like you know, come back to India, work in villages. Ah. Uh, ah. Uh. Or like you know, and then develop your career from there. But I didn't take that. Mm. Then I thought, okay, there is. Then I started seeing the connection between. <laughs> physics yes. and social social science. so yeah. there there is social dynamics statistical yeah. physics of social dynamics you know some papers actually came out during that time okay kind of econo physics also econo physics also was uh, emerging during nice, nice. Right? and uh, here i was interested in statistical physics i was trying to read these things uh, complex systems uh, and uh, few other essays kind of uh, interviewed me like You know this more is different. More is, yeah, uh, Anderson. Anderson. P. W. Anderson. P. W. Anderson. That's one of the highly cited uh, references in my podcast. Is you it? Know, uh-huh. Probably, maybe is the second. First one is the Four Lessons by uh, uh, Weinberg. <laughs> so I keep that. citing that. I yeah, yeah, it's a fantastic essay. More is different. Is uh, yeah. uh, the complexity emergence. Exactly. Although those words are not used, all the things are actually covered. Yeah, as there, you know, it kind of originated. Originated. Yeah. Yeah. Later, there is complexity institute. Many of these students came up. Absolutely. Absolutely. But he kind of gave that conceptual awesome. foundations. You know, how do you understand from higher and as you go from higher level of complexity, like yes. from physics to chemistry to biology, to understanding humans to societies. So each level mm-hmm. there is a different complexity and different level of techniques that are used to understand those. You know. And fantastic yeah fantastic. Mm. so then i said society is you know very complex you yeah. know? so maybe i should try to understand using some statistical techniques mm. i think then i got interested in complex systems complex adaptive systems so read those literature for my post doc i actually applied for that uh-huh. so networks and complex systems uh-huh. okay so i this was my idea that okay uh-huh. maybe i will gradually shift, yeah. okay uh-huh. maybe this is way i maybe i can contribute to uh-huh. this you know using complex system thing okay So, postdoc, I worked on um, disease uh, dynamics. Yes, yes, okay. yes. I had other background in public health. During demography, I also did an intern uh, when I was doing demography. Mm. I did an internship at International Institute of Population Sciences in Mumbai. Mumbai, oh, for, interesting. Good you know, for three months. There, I worked on public health in India. So, Very a lot nice. of large scale data I started using. The first time in nationwide survey data, yeah, I used. So I started looking at the healthcare facilities, <laughs> utilization, and all those statistical modeling. I started doing. Nice. There, nice. I also developed some spatial skills, you know, GIS methods yeah. kind of stuff that I use. Okay. So, like, I had some interest in public health during that time, and uh, in postdoc, the problem was primarily about uh, disease propagation models on the networks. So, you know, how does disease actually mm. spread? Yes, I R S I S those kind of models. Which were also came up during the COVID time. COVID time. People okay. are doing those, you know, yes, I R type of mm-hmm. right. Mm-hmm. So that is when I did got into epidemiology. Yeah, so I did those. You know, I did publish. That is when nonlinear dynamics, statistical no. mechanics, you know, mm-hmm. and network science uh, <clears throat> blended together. Nice. And uh, I got one or two papers out of that. Okay. Yeah. So that was postdoc. Then uh, I had my family, like you know, mm. 
I was also having a baby then mm. I had to make a decision whether to do one more postdoc or to come back to India. So where was your postdoc? Uh, uh, postdoc was in Virginia Tech. Virginia Tech. Virginia. Uh, okay. Okay. Yeah. So this is when I had to make a decision. A decision. Yeah. Anyway, I wanted to come back to India. I had no question. There was it. no doubt about no it. No doubt about it. Why? Why issue? Tell me. <laughs> tell me a reason. Uh, because this is a crucial decision to make. Hmm. Uh, especially if you are in academics mm-hmm. there is always a dilemma mm-hmm. of whether to come back or not mm-hmm. all of us have gone through such kind of a dilemma most of the people who would have mm-hmm. actually gone out what what was your reason for that uh, maybe two or three reasons mm-hmm. one is if you are in pure science mm-hmm. let's say in sciences uh. academic jobs are very less less correct yeah, right. yeah it's yeah. a very competitive yeah. tenure system is hard many mm-hmm. people don't get so many of my own friends who did uh rate work you know but they had to take up jobs in let's say community colleges yeah yeah okay so because job market is so tight tight in yes, us yes right and some of them became consultants uh, you know uh, they exited physics at oh, some point okay so they started doing machine learning ai yeah, kind of mm, stuff mm. okay um, job crunch is one of them and i didn't want to be the person who wants to do around 5 year 7 years yeah, post okay yeah. and i knew from my own lab over there like mm, you know 5 mm. to 6 years became a norm norm that's not an exception yeah, that's know. a very very long time for a post time yeah. Yeah. so i didn't want to uh, do that that is one reason other thing is you know if i want to work on developmental issues uh, i had uh, strong interest in working in india india mm-hmm. in demography like uh, i also learned about problems in us but coming from india i yeah. thought their problems are minuscule compared to the problems india is facing <laughs> nice nice the challenges here are far more and india is a fertile ground to earn understand this complex developmental issues you know so there i think they have passed certain developmental stages so it is far less complex complex nice. compared to the indian state nice. Okay. nice so since i was also keen on working on india and working in mm. so then i decided okay i should come back family reasons also yeah. that's the yeah. third reason so i decided to come back and uh, at that time thanks to emergence of new iits and icers yeah you know so i applied to many places mm. and uh, finally got into iit gandhinagar gandhinagar yes yes yeah and then i moved back in 2012 mm. okay moved back now iit gandhinagar was an interesting place mm. it started in 2007 yeah yeah it was a s- small iit at that time mm. it was just 4 years in its existence maybe around 70 faculty were there 60 to 70 faculty that's nice it, you know so we were in some place called sheds mm. Mm. now small place has some advantages too mm. barring the disadvantages mm. because iit like you know, of course you have engineering faculty but you also have science faculty yes yes and then you have humanities faculty yes yes and now it's a small place everyone's office is next door to each other nice nice okay and we are a budding institute uh. we have to collaborate with each other uh. there is no other option uh. we will encounter others uh. if there is a masters student defense A civil engineering will call me. Nice, nice. Sometimes in my sociology PhD mm. or a political science, mm. they would call me because less number of people, and I also had this interdisciplinary Interdis- interest. interest. I used to be called. Okay. Very nice. In one corridor, we had such diverse set of people, mm. including archaeology, literature, yes, yes. music. Yes. You know, so it was very enriching. Energy, nice. It was demanding also because we are building the yeah, institute. Yeah. and uh, we had challenges because no none of the programs were set especially physics phd we were trying to build yeah, physics yeah. masters program we were trying to build you know but along with that we had ma- phd yeah. students in which we had to be part of the doctoral student committees masters students masters thesis committees so it was lot of work yeah. very strenuous work but also interesting mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. so i was in earth sciences wala phd committee Nice. <laughs> First time I understood, like you know, how this river system is uh, modeled. Nice. I was in archaeology, uh, like you know, sociology. I first got to understand how these people think. Uh, Anthropologists, uh, you know, they start thinking about uh, problems. Nice, yeah. nice. So that was a very enriching experience there. Nice. Okay? I worked closely with two faculty, like mainly on public health uh, related stuff. Yes, yes. We also worked on human development reports in Ahmedabad. Yes, yes, yeah. that is something. Of course, all the things what Tishu is referring to, uh, I'll be linking in the show notes. Uh, many of the references are also part of his very interesting uh, kind of uh, writings on medium. 
and uh, we'll come to that point uh, later too but i'm going to link a lot of uh, information uh, where you can go and also check a lot of uh, other things uh, yeah continue yeah yeah yeah. So, yeah at this time we also developed this curriculum for ma in society and culture mm -hmm. and that's program in id gandhi Limit. and also msc in physics both were happening and i requested a joint position yes yes in uh, social sciences mm. and thanks to the director he agreed wonderful that wonderful you know? so there in iit i was mm. teaching two social science courses education history and policy nice and also demography wonderful also teaching demography. Wonderful. so i was doing teaching quantum mechanics mm. <laughs> and electrodynamics and also teaching you know education mm. and demography these type of courses mm. you know used to have so in that way that was kind of branching out into social science social science okay so i had phd students in physics but i also had some master students in nice physics, nice okay? so this blend starts happening mm. over there now yeah. so that was pretty enriching learned a lot also started publishing few papers mm. Mm. and articles on these okay and uh, this time i got to work with the government Uh -huh. When really? I was in US, it was very difficult to work with the US government yeah. mainly because I was a foreign citizen, foreign citizen. And, yeah. and funding is also very challenging if you're not a yeah. um, like you know citizen. In India, like being in IIT, they kind of welcome the yes. Gujarat government, central government. They said if you want to work on something, okay. Fantastic. Yeah. That's very uh, refreshing. Mm -hmm. But is that the norm? See, I actually know a few historians, uh, especially historians of science, who are Indian citizens who are working abroad. are having difficulty in getting access to information is that the norm generally uh, information in us or information in india? in india yeah in india when you are abroad right it's oh, very hard to get yeah. okay okay if you are affiliated with an indian institution especially if you are a uh, central government central, institution uh, so there is already some degree some of credibility, credibility that is established yeah yeah, yeah. Okay. so some of the government becomes you know more willing to share willing to share is it okay uh, interesting Good, okay. good. That's good. So, uh, like, but I'm not telling we get, can get every data. Yeah, yeah, It's yeah. It's very hard. Even yeah. in uh, then, you know, some data were refused to us. Okay. okay. Many a times, you know, we start seeking informal channels uh -huh. so yeah. with friendships and all. Yeah, and we yeah. Start getting some data. But let's say comparatively, let's say if you are a not a government employee uh -huh. or a not uh -huh. if you are from private institution, uh -huh. it is very hard to get uh, data. Data is India, okay. Right. But. If, government you know that makes it easier mm, okay. mm. so for example so i was working on uh, spread of dengue mm. in um, ahmedabad mm, mm. you know how spatial and temporal spread Temple, of dengue yes, yes. for that i needed the uh, dengue cases by ward level okay, city, okay. Oh, so oh. detailed thing and also rainfall oh. uh, rainfall temperature mm. and fortunately they also had something called mosquito density wow so you measured it yeah they have measured it <laughs> <laughs> cool. In different time periods, how can you? What is the average number of mosquitoes are there per room? Wow! And that I got it at the ward level. And just I went to this entomologist. He was very friendly. Like oh. he was keen that okay, you want to do some research. IIT say oh, oh. like you know that kind of game. Amazing. Just in a pen drive game. Wow, that's exciting. Like you know, <laughs> that really helped me yeah. a lot. Yeah. Okay. I could do a very detailed mm. analysis of how the dengue spreads in the city city oh. ward level mm. you know spatial modeling i did partial differential equation and all those things i added plus also temporal analysis i could do i had all the rainfall data spectral analysis so yeah that i could do thanks to you know connection with and the municipal corporation and the entomologist okay yeah so this happened work with the uh, you know, gujarat government with on human development report nice. in andabad mm. which i collaborated with other social science groups mm. okay worked with ngos like pratham mm. pratham yeah yeah in education mm. started doing field surveys okay so uh, conducting um, like teaching and learning evaluations mm. Mm. in different villages okay so that <clears throat> that access really helped me mm. you know, and as uh, in india the contrast between us and india is like in us we were studying from a distance yes yes okay here now you directly come you in contact really, with the yeah, people on the ground like, yeah. on the ground you oh. understand it far better i totally enjoyed, enjoyed it i had yeah. no uh, qualms about it mm. i loved it okay very nice yeah so yeah that slowly helped me to get grounding in in india in social sciences social sciences nice okay. uh, 
and I also mm. worked in Bangalore, like Akshara Foundation. Akshara, okay. uh, yes, yes. On education. Education. Yes. Karnataka school, uh, uh. there is a report that I published on the small schools and school consolidation. Mm. So, wherein we looked at uh, school enrollment in different government schools in Karnataka, urban, rural, tribal area. We did a field study. Field study. And this is all still when you are in Gandhinagar? Yeah, Gandhinagar, okay. 17, nice. 18. And did intensive data analysis, you know, so all the uh, like schools in Karnataka. Nice. So that yeah. is where I use my skills, mm. uh, you know, in physics. Okay, you were asking about this question, right? How did physics actually help? Help, yeah. Okay. yeah, yeah. Some of, uh, we kind of, physics training kind of helped me to get a good sense of numbers, mm, mm. right? Numbers and their patterns, patterns and then visualizations, you know, some, um, which may be difficult for a person, person. who is not trained in yeah, physics, yeah. right? So for me, like, you know, data analysis, visualization, inferences nice. were coming much more naturally mm. compared to others. Okay. But to back it, I also had some theoretical background from the social sciences. Social sciences. Okay. So both of them mixed together was a healthy combination. Wonderful. Mm. See, you one thing I want to, uh, you know, touch upon, this is an important point, what you are also mentioning, is uh, a slightly kind of a difference between conventional sciences and uh, social sciences because I have found in many a cases uh, because I am also kind of uh, experiencing this because I have interest in history of science mm -hmm. and I see that uh, the the way humanities people treat mm -hmm. people from outside mm -hmm. is very welcoming. Uh, the other way around is not, I am not telling we are in in basic sciences don't treat people well <laughs> but what i mean to say is it's it's almost impossible for somebody who is uh -huh. from a social science background coming to, to coming into let's say physics which uh -huh. it, it is kind of a it, it looks looked upon as an upstream kind of a upstream. thing mm -hmm. can you tell us about the sociological aspect before we move into your your f uh, final transition uh -huh. <laughs> into yeah. to pune so in natural sciences there is mentally created disciplinary boundaries. Yes, you're right. Okay. You're right. Sometimes physicists also may not respect chemistry as much as people. Yeah. Yeah. So sometimes Arthur Reddington famously said all yeah. physics. Yeah. All yeah. sciences are either physics, physics or stamp, stamp collection. collection. Uh, sorry to yeah. So is there a specific difference you find? Personally? Yeah, because we have this mental boundaries uh -huh. of one field over the thing and also kind of ranking of disciplines. Uh, one is more superior yes, than the other. Yes. So that prevents by entry. So even let's say when I was doing complex system, uh, so people who are doing more core, uh, like, you know, physics, yeah. let's say black hole physics, or uh, they're doing gravitational wave yeah. or other things, you know, they wouldn't l look at this field, mm -hmm. um, you know, or respect, respect this field. This field. Yes, yeah. Sure, yeah. I think we are missing out on something. Yeah. Uh, I think uh, uh, missing, we in the sense, we in physical sciences especially, uh, I think if we don't open it up mm -hmm. a little bit more or at least pay attention to these elements and you can see there are a lot of problems where mm -hmm. uh, if you are isolating yourself from the societal aspect mm -hmm. of it, I am not telling physicists don't uh, do applied stuff mm -hmm. or do something uh, beneficial to society. But that insular nature sometimes actually is detrimental. Yeah, absolutely. Right? Yeah. 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 So we should realize at some point that all fields are connected yeah, in absolutely. one or the other. Yeah. Like, you know, so uh, it is <clears throat> only like many of these barriers are yeah. you know, created mentally. Yeah. Right? You know? So, for example, to give an example, biology hmm. in my childhood, yeah. I didn't like it so much. Hmm. Yes. Okay. When I started doing demography, I also did population ecology, population nice. biology a bit. Okay, so demography talks about population changes, but it also talks about let's say animal population changes, human demography. There is also a part of the ecology, uh, ecology part. Yeah. Okay, for example, Vishwesha does those kind yeah, of things. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah, you're right. Yeah, and there are certain methodological similarity between these two. Right, and then I realized, wow, like you know, when I was uh, analyzing this population biology, yeah, you know. Uh, like beautiful connection between evolution and nice. I kind of realized that there is one like there is some parameter called uh, uh, like Fisher's R there is no, like growth, uh, rate. Uh, yeah, growth rate, yes. growth rate. Yeah. and that is linked to fitness fantastic okay 
no i started seeing this connection why you know i am doing demography i am seeing this connection yeah and uh, this kind of there are few other thing that i learned let's say we study mortality uh. so <laughs> even in engineering there is something called a reliability analysis there also we study some kind of a mortality yeah. so i started seeing this interconnection between this so in other thing information theory is also something mm. which could be interlinked across the discipline i learned about pullback library divergence kind of measures when i was in engineering a bit so then i saw in the quantum information theory like fidelity measures yes. you know yes then i was doing demography then i saw okay kl divergence is coming in population distance measurement oh uh, uh, wow it is interlinked interlinked yes yes like everywhere i am seeing this connection you know how can you treat one as you know very distinct to one field and not the no, others absolutely right? Right. Yeah. And when I was doing uh, complex system disease modeling, like you know, public health actually comes into picture. Yeah, yeah. So you have to understand about um, public health systems a bit, and also let's say other let's say environmental parameters. Parameters. You know, those things also you need to. Okay. Nice. So nice. what you need is in being an openness. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Not to limit yourself Self to, to one uh, area. Okay. Even if you are not doing that area, but you know, you should respect that. You know, there are connections. and people should be you know open to open to uh, wonderful wonderful this is very illuminating gashu because uh, there there may be a lot of people who may be interested in in uh, doing this also uh, because uh, the kind of training you get in physics as you mentioned is very very useful mm-hmm. also to to branch branch out so um, now that you are uh, doing this kind of work still you know anchored in the physics department how was how was your Uh, experience in a physical sciences department uh, and uh, what was your process and what was your further transition and other things yeah at this stage i was doing like one is disease dynamics mm-hmm. modeling and also collaboration network scientific yes, collaboration yeah, yeah, network yeah. Okay. so i looked at the like indian physics collaboration yes yes so there, there's a very so nice I, kind of uh, piece of work what you have done there yeah, right so kind yeah. of traced all the publications in physical review yeah. journals from 1920s to 2013 mm-hmm. so almost 100 years data so got amazing patterns uh. you know in the way indian physicists actually collaborated mm. in the past in the 70s in the 90s mm. and in the present and variation across fields, fields. so nice. people who do condensed matter theory they have something uh. you know, high energy physics have yeah. large number of authors they have lot of foreign collaborators multi authored yes. papers mm. you know so we kind of uh, like you know deciphered all these patterns patterns right nice, you know, nice. by doing this large scale analysis mm-hmm. which i am was very happy about mm-hmm. it it took almost 2 years to crunch this data mm-hmm. extract crunch mm-hmm. and uh, visualize and then uh, make inferences and after this work actually some people like tv ramkrishnan oh. like you know they made me oh wow names were mentioned wonderful and we could figure out the position of different scientists and when a particular topic actually emerged emerged wonderful that was like it is essentially science of science <laughs> science of science nice science of science. nice okay like if you you can actually search when the word superconductivity actually came it came out wow high temperature superconductivity nice. when it became a norm nice height is nice. nice so and then who are all the people who are working working on, on that yes okay you can figure out those stack right Nice, nice. and when did a scientific community on high tc mm. superconductivity happened in india versus when it happened in us us nice. so is there a time lag between these two nice when do indian physicists adopt the western ideas or are they creating a, their own, own ideas, ideas. Okay. Nice. nice these kind of analysis can be done through this collaboration network wonderful so nice. i was doing all this you know pattern analysis you know all there so thanks to you know phd mm. students who are working on it and we also did brain network analysis oh, oh, oh. there was a cognitive science, uh, cognitive science yeah. thing which we we collaborated so like natya shastra oh. so <clears throat> navarasa is mm. there right so does it induce different uh, electrical signals in different parts of the brain nice. is there a pattern let's say nice nice so using eeg eeg data, okay okay so we kind of try to uncover some of the patterns in the navarasa wonderful you know, so that was interesting so i was doing all these things some people appreciated it but some people said that okay you are not doing physics <laughs> yeah at all but i didn't care so much hmm. yeah hmm. and social science and i was working with other uh, faculty members in public health and other things nice yeah. nice mm. 
so then uh, uh, what motivates you to make a full transition into social science yeah. uh, tell us about that phase transition yeah, the phase transition <laughs> whether it is continuous or discontinuous <laughs> yeah so this time as i said uh, like i was doing these things but uh, like since it was not considered as core physics <coughs> yeah. in getting let's say an associate professorship yeah. or like you know higher promotion so it was becoming challenge okay at that time and uh, and also i was finding it difficult mm. because i was doing both the things a yeah. lot of constraints on time yeah yeah uh, and maybe i felt i'm not doing justice to one field right. yeah. yeah okay so then i said okay maybe i should move fully mm. and also i wanted to move closer to karnataka oh oh pune like yeah. my native place is actually dharwad dharwad yes uh, nice is overnight journey yes, here yes culturally this place is far more mm. closer to north karnataka uh, yes you are right north pune has a very large overlap mm. yeah. and pune has nice trekking places yeah. also like, <laughs> so many things which attracted me to pune okay. okay okay yeah and then i also wanted to do this transition because uh, i felt it was becoming very challenging, challenging. to do both the things mm. for a long time mm. so then i decided okay, i apply to flame university got it See, that, came. that's quite remarkable you because uh, first of all you should have that conviction uh, to make a move because uh, having a job at iit is a kind of a sorted of uh, mm-hmm. thing generally speaking second is also even bigger conviction to move uh, totally into social sciences mm-hmm. and uh, i'm also amazed that uh, flame actually was open enough to yeah, exactly. to uh, take uh, a mm-hmm. person with a different background mm-hmm. uh and uh, that's actually very refreshing yeah and uh, is this a norm in social sciences generally speaking no right yeah, i don't think so it's yeah. very rare in india you know for non social scientists to enter into social, social sciences. Yeah. sciences it's i don't i have not seen much cases out of this so much Actually, so that you even are heading that particular department now oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> right mm-hmm. that yeah, is amazing it may be the head <laughs> yeah yeah that's amazing actually i uh, no one should really appreciate the university which is yeah. doing that kind of thing yeah and yeah, they were open to it uh-huh. in fact our own dean uh-huh. santosh kurtarkar uh-huh. he is actually a phd in physics wow from okay. imsc fantastic fantastic yeah. but all are dean of liberal education they're all theoritics <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> no no kidding in fact i also know a lot of people who moved into finance mm-hmm. and other areas from theoretical physics yeah yeah, yeah. yeah so he was open to it like nice. he is liberal education like you know on, yeah. uh, he's the dean of that nice. uh, and he was happy to have me fantastic so, fantastic like, uh, yeah and thankfully they were welcoming and as soon as i came i had to teach many courses in which um, i was not trained in mm-hmm. but i did train myself so one thing i learned in the last 20 years that okay if you have want to learn a subject maybe i can master it fantastic fantastic uh, given some amount given of, some amount of, of time okay i mean not to yeah. like you know professional in it but i can competent com- and, com- be sufficiently competent, competent. Yes, yes you know so yeah that the, also is the unique confidence you get with an education in physics i yeah, think I so see, yeah, right because yeah. uh, mm-hmm. that somehow gives you a lot more confidence in the sense Uh, because for example if you, if i'm reading let's say your engineering literature hmm. uh, which is not very far sometimes yeah. uh, uh, to physics at least but even otherwise if you're ta- uh, reading something in slightly quantitative social science and other things hmm. for us it's not very difficult exactly. to exactly not so difficult, difficult to right? understand yeah. yeah yeah we can understand the broader yeah. methods and techniques you know in fact economics papers which have a lot of mathematics which generally economics people don't like yeah. uh, we can actually we can <laughs> grasp it actually. grasp yeah. it yeah i have Try to actually even if we don't some... know it, maybe we can do a simple search and understand the basic basic concept. Exactly, okay. exactly. Yeah, that's what I have realized. Nice, like, nice, you know. nice. Yeah, thanks to my training. Training. Yeah, yeah, yeah wonderful. That, yeah. Wonderful. So um, now uh, we'll come to the, uh, the the research element of mm-hmm. your work. Uh, first of all, you please tell us what is the kind of work you are now doing. Mm-hmm. And second is we'll also go to your some of your writings and uh, discuss a little bit. Mm-hmm. So before we go into your writings, uh, can you please tell us? a little bit about the kind of research uh, problems on which you are working on and uh, what is the kind of directions you are taking okay. okay so one thing for example two years back you know i was very interested in understanding the language language diversity yeah okay because in india uh, i saw this problem that in the childhood 
Yeah. Uh, like most of the schooling, especially the private schooling, is in English. Yes, yes. But the mother tongue is different, especially for a uh, children who are um, who don't have an environment of English, but still they are forced to be in an English medium school. So there are reports that they fall back. Yes, in their yes. learning. Yeah, because in the school they cannot learn about social science or. Sciences mm. in English when they are not exposed to it at all. At all, yeah. Absolutely. So their learning outcomes actually suffer. So that kind of led me to understand this language, language diversity in India. Wonderful, wonderful. Yeah. So I thought there are only few languages in India. What is there in the constitution? Twenty-two languages. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> and that is on the basis of which our uh, like you know states were states, formed. Yeah, yeah. Okay, this was my basic understanding. Yeah, yeah. But when I started digging deeper, uh, then I said, no, no, this is 22 is a minimal thing. Okay. <laughs> the Ganesh Devi's survey found yeah. out almost 780 living languages in India. Yes, yes. Now being a quant-minded person, I uh, wanted to mine this data. Nice. So I went to the census document they had released this 2011. Oh. Nationwide, you can oh. get the language, uh, the mother tongue of uh, people. You know, at village level also. You can wow, fantastic, yeah. fantastic. So, but I analyze at the state and the district, district. level. Okay. Then, uh, <clears throat> so I took this data, did lot of number crunching, nice, and try to calculate this diversity index. Okay, this is again, you know, my training in physics, uh -huh. divergence, uh, diversity measures, uh -huh. you know, uh, like Thiel index that can that's a logarithmic yeah, yeah. based uh, measure, Gini index that's there uh -huh. in the economics. So um, Atkinson index. There is class of yeah, diversity right. measures. I thought I will use it for this. Nice, okay. nice. So that is when I split the data by state level and then different type language, mother tongue, scheduled and non-scheduled languages, detailed analysis I did, and also calculate this index, you know, diversity index. There I started seeing you know fascinating patterns. Nice. That in some states like northeastern state, they give the highest diversity in India. Wow. Like northeastern, whom. Many of the languages we don't even know, know about. Most yes. people don't even know yeah. about these things. Okay. And uh, northeastern state, tribal districts, you know, that is where <coughs> there is highest linguistic diversity is there. And for those uh, states, you know, the children over in those states are being forced to learn maybe the state's majority, majority language. Yeah. For yeah. example, Santali is the language of the children in Jharkhand, mm. you know, some mm. tribal group, but they are made to learn Hindi. Mm -hmm. But that may be very different from there, right? So that yes. was a motive, and I thought this index kind of may guide you. Oh, oh. It's, look, you can visualize that this area is very high linguistic mm -hmm. diversity. Maybe you should think of providing mother tongue education. Education, that nice. Nice. Yeah. yeah, this is one example. Another thing which I started in IIT Gandhinagar, which I am not fully completed, mm -hmm. but something which was very interesting, is about this constitution. Oh, yes. So yes. we had this constituent assembly debates oh. that ran for three years. Mm. Okay. So there are uh, law fraternity has analyzed some of these constitution assembly debates by looking at certain specific topics. Let's nice. say sedition topic when oh. was it discussed? Education, right to education when was it discussed? You know. So they did it by reading it para by para. Oh. Mm. But I wanted to analyze it as a whole. Okay. So in um, uh, 2018, we mm. started this project wherein we kind of collected all this data mm -hmm. of uh, three years, 12 volumes, digitized wow. data. Nice. Thanks to Parliament and also Center for Law and Policy Research. Uh -huh. mm. We cleaned up the data, we analyzed it. And then we started looking at the speeches of the people by name, by mm. date, date. Uh -huh. you know, and by volume. Nice. You know, all these things. Now, Got amazing patterns. Uh -huh. you know, we had almost 300 members of the Constituent Assembly. So some of them spoke a lot. Uh -huh. Some did not speak at all. At all. Mm. Okay. So like Ambedkar spoke many places. There mm. was another Karnataka called H.V. Kamath. He also Kamath. spoke oh, a really? lot. But really? most people don't even know his name. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Really? H.V. Kamath. Next after Ambedkar comes the H.V. Kamath. Wow. Wow. That's we quantified the number of words they spoke. Uh. And when did they speak? Uh, and what you know assembly and sometimes you know what topics did they speak on speak on okay. okay we extracted keywords from there and uh, we got some amazing pattern you know just uh, two years back we wrote this article in mint yes you know, yes wherein we quantified the inequality in the speech uh -huh. okay? 
So imagine in a classroom, so some students are more active, some students are less active, some people don't speak at all. So who is the most vocal? Mm, okay. mm. So number of words is, you can think it more like a amount of money that a money, person owns. Yeah, yeah. And person, there are 10 people, each one speaks different number of words. And inequality in this, it's like a Gini index, which mm. I learned from economics. Mm, mm. So we did the Gini index of this. First time we quantified the inequality in the constant assembly debate, 0.756. Nice. So nice. it was a highly unequal debate. Mm, mm. For example, women, Had out of 15 uh, members, five didn't couldn't speak at all. Not a word. Not a word. The zero words. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Other insights, you know, we got like Ambedkar never uttered a word on Gandhi. Zero words. Ah, interesting. Right? <laughs> in he spoke the most, but there was an Ambedkar Gandhi feud. Yeah, nice, nice. Yeah. And then uh, rights. Mm. Uh, freedom and many of these words, who spoke on what topic, we started extracting these things. But uh, I think Gandhi was not directly involved in Yeah, this. Gandhi was not part of the Constant Assembly debate. Yeah. But a lot of people talked about Gandhi. Ah, because they, they derived a lot of uh, kind of inspiration. inspiration. From, okay, interesting. Very interesting. Yeah, so now if somebody <laughs> says, historians, they say that, okay, Gandhi and Ambedkar, they had a feud. Mm. Well, at least Ambedkar yeah. did yeah. not acknowledge Gandhi mm. so much. But does is it reflected in the Constant Assembly? Now we can clearly say that, yes. Very interesting. Okay. Very interesting. And also, what topic did you talk about? You know, Dalits, Adivasis, yeah. and uh, you know all these rights we talked about. Okay. Yeah. So we got this topical analysis you know, done you know, by looking at the frequency of this. Now I felt this was very enriching. Fantastic. Purely like you know looking at numbers yeah. and putting our own insights. If I want to know who spoke on this topic, I will search. Search the nice. And then place it in nice graphs and make the patterns come. In nice. that way, this debate starts coming alive. Very nice, very nice. And this is foundational debate. Because the, it is yeah. literally the foundation on which the country is that established, is right? That's uh, fascinating, yeah. fascinating. Beautiful, yeah. beautiful. And conti yeah. we are continuing this work, but the thing is we are looking at historical constitution, constitution. also. Nice. How yeah. the constitution actually came into being. Ah. It's a result of multiple iterations of the historical con constitutions and also constituent assembly debates. Debates, you know, nice. Putting it together. Mm -hmm. That work is going on. Wonderful, wonderful, fascinating, fascinating. So now we'll also kind of touch upon some of the your writings, which is very interesting. And I found uh, some of the things uh, uh, what you have uh, written in Medium also to be very illuminating. And of course, you also published in various journals and also uh, um, online uh, platforms like Mint, Scroll, and other places. Uh, so, first of all, before we get into specifics of some interesting questions you are raising in these articles, could you tell us about what what is the process of your own writing? Because uh, you also are uniquely placed with the fact that you have a quantitative viewpoint mm -hmm. and you are now also leading some very interesting kind of uh, thoughts uh, from a narrative perspective too. Mm -hmm. For example, uh, bringing these two things together actually is probably the most powerful way of telling a story. Mm -hmm. Could you please tell us a little bit about this yeah. aspect? See, this narrative also comes because, you know, if you are teaching a so social science, mm -hmm. you need to have narration. Yes, yes. You need to have stories in it. And since I was teaching it, like you have to read a lot. Yes. You need to make people understand on this and you have to build a story out of this okay so that is what you know pushed me into writing yeah although i don't find that much time to read uh, write regularly uh, uh. but i have at least three to four months in, in every four to five months maybe I yeah yeah to publish some of them as much as possible so there are one is popular level articles yeah. where you know to reach wider audience we published in uh, scroll on federalism yes you yes. know on mint on the constitution and few on education also. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So uh, those things, you know, it's a narrative form. Quantitative results, for example, in India Forum. We, yeah, India Forum. Uh, yeah. We published this on uh, linguistic diversity of India. Nice. Right. So that attracted a mm -hmm. lot of uh, attention. Attention. Yeah. Because the first time, you know, you are seeing state level mm -hmm. and like you know, language, language diversity, where. Whereas most people thought that in Maharashtra or Karnataka, mm -hmm. in big state, there are only few languages yeah. spoken. Like right? so people were not aware of a lot of the schedule, non-scheduled languages Lots as we call. Nice, okay. nice. And you know, this article brought uh, into light those things. Fantastic. Okay? And we also kind of critiqued census mm -hmm. classification because it excludes a lot of this. Whatever we analyze is actually a subset, subset of, the, of that. Yeah, okay? you're right. So census also excludes almost 1.8 crore 
people's mother tongues. Wow. Okay. Because individually, the total number of speakers are less than ten thousand. Uh -huh. So our main article was that imagine, even with the existing census itself, we get so much diversity. So much diversity. But if you include even those languages, India is far more linguistically Linguistic. diverse than than it is thought. So that attracted a lot of uh, attention. Wonderful. Yeah. Wonderful. Yeah. So specifically, uh, you. you also have this uh, viewpoint of uh, looking at uh, demography mm -hmm. as a crucial element of a uh, lot of things what you do mm -hmm. and i have seen that even in your recent uh, kind of writings as late as uh, may 2023 mm -hmm. you also write uh, demography in service of other services yeah that's a beautiful kind of an article which i came across mm -hmm. and of course i'll be linking your medium uh, link mm -hmm. uh, so that and good thing is uh, listeners Please know that, uh, like a very good academician, uh, Shivu puts all the articles open source, <laughs> free to read, free to read. and that is something which we really, uh, we really uh, appreciate. That is a very important thing. So tell us about that, uh, Shivu. Your demography is still at the heart of a lot of arguments you make. Mm -hmm. And uh, see, to understand society, you have to understand people. Yeah. Right? Society is composed of people. even if you are a social sociologist let's say they want to understand about the number of people uh, in different caste religion yeah, yeah. race ethnicity all these groups they require population data yeah okay not only aggregate data you have to split it into different groups so you have to see how the distribution is and then uh, spatial and temporal distribution temporal that is essential for sociologists anthropologists even economists even if you want to calculate a very simple thing like gdp per capita you need population, population. denominator yeah in education if you want to calculate a simple thing like gross enrollment rate in primary education so you need a denominator number of children in that age yeah. higher education 26% the ger when you have to say that you need to know how many people are there in the higher education 18 to 24 yeah so everywhere you need Population, population numbers yeah. we thought yeah. that you can't do any quantitative social sciences absolutely right absolutely right. so but unfortunately it is kind of neglected you know people think that demography is only about uh, population, population birth deaths yeah, yeah, and other yeah, things exactly so, but i think is it is serving, serving so many other disciplines absolutely, absolutely it is very much it's like a very core tool you know mm -hmm. like math we have for physics right absolutely absolutely like you need, need yeah. math it is the language in which you speak that right So even demography is like that. So, and because I was trained in demography, I could understand many fields much better. Wonderful, yeah. wonderful. So that's why I keep emphasizing. Yeah. I've been teaching this course for many times. Nice. So, in fact, the linkage is today itself. I came from a uh, uh. class in which I talked about the the genetic history of Indian's population. Nice. So nice. how Indians we are composed of migrants from Africa. Uh -huh. with steppy regions yeah. and then in iran yes. all this which made us you know population demography yeah, even to understand our own being yeah. let's say who we are yes yes we need to understand demography absolutely absolutely, right. okay. absolutely right. so in that way in almost everything that i do demography naturally, naturally. and in the background it is always there and i always look at let's say census figures yeah. in fact yeah. i have been working on this urban growth um, urbanization in india mm. so mm. we are looking at data from 1872 Thanks. Thanks. So we have the census data. Uh, thanks to digitized census data, mm -hmm. so we are able to extract it, right? And then do a time series. Nice, that, nice. Right? Yeah, it helps us to understand, like let's say, city like Bombay, mm. how did it grow? City yeah. like Pune, exactly. exactly. What was its population? When did it grow the maximum? Yeah. Yeah. Like, what are the reasons for its growth? That requires population. Population, number, number absolutely. Number. Right. Absolutely. Right. So, I don't know, like whatever work I've been doing. So, automatically comes in. comes into this yeah. stream fantastic yeah. fantastic so another uh, very interesting uh, element uh, related to uh, uh, to to your writing of course is the constitution aspect and you also mentioned a very interesting article written in october about the constitution and its gandhian alternative yeah. uh, uh, it also kind of brings in the contrast of the fact that gandhi did not Yeah, be uh, was part of the constitution, mm -hmm. and you also kind of give the Gandhian alternative. Mm -hmm. And uh, could you tell us a little bit about what is that alternative? What we are talking yeah. about? Mm -hmm. So when India's constitution was being formed, there are few things. You know, one is we had the Government of India Act 1935, which kind of gave one structure, structure yeah. to the constitution. Now at that time, partition was happening. There was bloodshed. Yeah, yeah, happening everywhere. Now. 
the big question behind the constant assembly was how to keep the union strong, strong. Mm -hmm. like with from prevent it from balkanization nice. we don't want it to be fragmented so these were the ideas both nehru and ambedkar <coughs> and also other constant assembly members they were in favor of strong center center yeah, yeah like yeah. you know power uh, should sure. be rested with the center and to some extent states or federalism starts at center and then comes at the states they did not consider anything about the local, local. governance local bodies okay. but most of the issues that we face on a day to day basis like you know water electricity garbage collection this you know we face lot of local issues, issues. you know yes. it has and even schooling sure. education is a local subject and um, like healthcare like you go to neighborhood it doesn't require a central government invention for many other things yes. gandhi always envisioned a society in which the power should be devolved to the lowest, lowest level. level yeah yeah okay like gram panchayat should take a yeah. lead in this in city like you know the nagar yeah, municipal, uh, municipality yeah. they should take a lead and ward members yeah should. and now, it's still not realized huh? it's still not realized yeah. Yeah. now unfortunately if you look at our newspapers the news is always about the parliamentarians or state level politicians so the population to politician ratio of the state assembly or it's huge absolutely none of us if you actually think about it we would not have met them in person we yes. would not have interacted with them yes so how do you hold them accountable how do you make them re, you know address our, our issues? issues gandhi clearly said if you want that to happen your representative should be your next door neighbor right? very nice fantastic okay. fantastic so only then you know you can hold them accountable that means it should be in the neighborhood neighbor yeah yeah the, you should be able proximity. to proximity proximity yeah, yeah yeah and local issue should be addressed locally local yeah nice okay. nice so gandhi's vision like he also envisioned a self sufficient village yes. economy yeah kind of thing so uh so this many countries if you look at over time so they have devolved functions to the local body in us school yeah there is a uh, school district that is there all children in the school district here they go to the public schools over there it is managed entirely by them here in many states in india i have recently written a paper on decentralization mm. related stuff it is a state government for example karnataka karnataka government schools are there very little municipality schools, schools in india yeah, yeah. in karnataka so most states in india it is the state government state which control the yeah, schooling yeah. but school should be a local, local issue. issue precisely like, you know precisely. and teacher should be from a lo local yeah. uh, area it should not come from a far away from a different district yeah. in fact that's the space now which has been occupied by private yeah uh, now it's private especially schools right because it is very local hmm. because the governance at least most of the time is within that particular place hmm. of course it might have connections to very far away places hmm. uh, but uh, is there a problem there uh, to yeah. bring in private especially in education and health of yeah, course so i know that will be a bit the short. route that we have taken is privatization oh. so in us 90% of the people yeah. even among the rich they send to public schools public schools yeah. japan almost 100% yeah, yeah, 100% till 9th grade they all send yeah. to public schools these are all the advanced developed yeah. countries where the capitalist economy <coughs> yeah speak speak india emerging <laughs> economy so we are doing exactly the opposite, opposite. instead of strengthening the public school system because it is tightly controlled less lesser funding lot of rigid uh, rules and we have not been able to maintain good school quality okay. in the government school so what is the alternative private schools private, private schools okay. took that space um <coughs> and then they are catering to the major the yeah. so it is very opposite of how the western countries actually developed in the western countries they built a strong a uh, public school system us ussr even china if you look at yeah, it yeah so they build that but in india we lack that yeah, maybe we maybe had public schools but i think they degenerated yeah yeah and uh, for example in my childhood i went to an aided school yes aided school even i went you your mes college was aided yeah, mes <laughs> college said we could study, study because it was exactly you know, there exactly. was no other way i could yeah, afford yeah. private school precisely right okay. yeah so that we are generating and schooling quality as Declined, Declined, and yeah. poor are actually shifting from government to the private, private schools yeah. because low cost private schools are emerged okay and this is the trajectory which i have written about oh, these things yes, you know yes. drain of government school there are a couple of articles yeah, yeah. on that so it's an unfortunate development yeah 
rather than strengthening for public school systems you know we have gone for the private right. so the argument of uh, of privatization if it actually is done in the right spirit hmm. uh, may actually fill in for some lacuna because of the fact that the local governments cannot cater to uh because in the in the light of no alternative yeah. uh this is probably is catering to to the uh, people right uh, yeah. so this is what is happening since yeah. you know we our schools are not delivering government schools you know the other yeah. alternative is private is but trying to fill that space that space okay even you know, as i said low cost government schools they mainly have fees between let's say 500 rupees to 1000 rupees per month yeah yeah it's supported to many of them but <clears throat> there also like you know some equity issues come in and uh, the question is are they actually delivering the quality? quality there are a lot of debates on it are these low cost private schools better than the uh, government, government schools, schools yeah. okay so there are uh, studies which says that um, so uh, low cost private schools pay low teacher salaries but their learning outcomes on an average is you know similar, similar to, to you know government schools you know so there are studies which says that in government school teachers are more qualified because if you want to be a regular right, teacher in a government school you need to pass the, pass the teacher eligibility test and also complete this in so, private schools especially in local you don't have you to don't have to do that nice yeah. nice so one more thing i want to actually just uh, touch upon a little bit uh, before we also move to uh, our own vernacular language <laughs> is uh, in the kannada is uh, the work you did also during the uh, pandemic Mm-hmm. Uh, that is something uh, which actually is very interesting could you mm-hmm. tell us what is the kind of work uh, you you did in the context of the research what you were looking at yeah, yeah. so during the pandemic uh, we saw that lockdown was imposed hastily yeah within 4 hours you know entire yeah. india was shut okay and after few days of the first lockdown you know, so there are a lot of unorganized sector workers you know who had who lost their employment yeah. okay suddenly they they were essentially leaving hand to mouth you know like yeah, daily yeah, wages yeah. all those things were and we could see this migrant crisis coming up we all saw in the newspapers right. and the tv you right. know how about this migrant crisis happening and i saw that diary in the pashan area yeah. close to this so a lot of people they were trying to flee they oh. were walking yeah. out or when the trains actually opened trying to take the trains you know so we wanted to study mm-hmm. their migrant distress Okay. This is the first time the migrants actually came out in the open. Suddenly, they became visible in the city. city. So, we wanted to study this distress and then reasons for this distress, and then what should be done about this. about this. Okay. Yeah. Then we conducted survey in Pune, so nice. primary survey. So, one of using one of our RAs. So, many areas in Pune, in fact, around this is Someshwari, yeah, yeah. and then Janta Vasahat. Now, using volunteers. we collected data phone interviews you know and then we did realize you know how precarious their lives were mm. you know because when you start thinking you know our jobs were there because we could do teaching online or research yeah, online yeah, could yeah, do more yeah, other things yeah. and our salary is affected yeah. so in india 92% of india is actually unorganized right. they right. don't get regular monthly salaries and they don't have a formal agreement with the yeah, employer, with employer yeah. so yeah. they can be fired any time yeah okay so this distress we quantify like you know unless you have a social security system oh. say that if you lose so called even jobs you should get some kind of a immediate, immediate benefit okay so you should if government take such an action they should give relief, relief to those you know you cannot log the country you know assuming that people will fend oh. for themselves oh. and you should ensure they get adequate Adequate. rations, adequate uh, money yeah. to sustain their families so we studied these things and then assessed the food security issues they were cutting down on things like all the vegetables they were cutting down yeah. mothers were cutting down on the milk okay we quantified these things okay okay yeah. but how did you kind of collect data locally you went uh, on a survey or something yeah so we uh, went on the survey nice, like, you know, nice. i was on the field sometime i had an ra Wonderful. many times with ngos we got the phone numbers list uh, we called those people and then asked questions you know were they forthcoming ha huh, like you know initially they would say you know they what what would happen because of this but mm-hmm. after some persuasion you know they would agree they would agree to along with that in the second way we also kind of ensured that some food aid is also there wonderful okay, wonderful we hooked up with um, a local uh, one person who was voluntarily doing this 
so many areas in Pashan. Pasha. So food packets were delivered daily. Wonderful, like, wonderful. Mm -hmm. So that at least temporarily this. Yeah, things are addressed. Yeah, yeah. In fact, Pune ha that way has a reasonably active civil society, civil society. Mm -hmm. kind of uh, thing. Fantastic, uh, Shu. This is all uh, so motivating, and also to learn about uh, how knowledge in one stream can be very effectively applied to another stream. So we'll now lighten the <laughs> the, <laughs> the the discussion a little bit. One of the things <clears throat> I ask uh, the guest on the podcast is to speak in their mother tongue uh -huh. about their motivations, mm -hmm. uh, why they do what they do, mm -hmm. and also uh, the kind of work they do. Mm -hmm. So uh, we both speak similar language, uh, and Canada. that is Kannada. Mm -hmm. So adu darinda Kannada dali. Just the, uh, what kind of work? You yau thara kelsa varthi na. What was the motivation? What was the motivation? What was the motivation? What was the motivation? This mainly migrants. So, migration and stalantaric. So, our like, 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 <laughs> conduct Madi or Indian problem Chitodan and then eat again document Madi. Matadan on the report around the published Madish. Sarkar Ku Kalsi, Maharashtra government, the Kalsi. Okay, that's the first lockdown at Mede. Second lockdown and Matadan follow up Madi. Our timely Maharashtra government already sold for relief Kota. Okay. Idu, you know, on the action research Tara. Okay. Something which impacts there. Hagen and education by Getumba Kesa Martin. She can help the Danganam Sarkari Shalegal, other day Makali Liga, Karnatic the Lena study Maridi, other Nalvatai Sara Shalegal is a stone of Sarkari Shalakari Shalakari. Pratun Halilum Sarkari Shalakari. Other stone Halil Hagitundre, Unund the Shaleli Ipatmaku, Kalonel Hatmaku, Purti Shaleli, Purti Salala. So, the standard in order, the Sartari Pratamika Shale. Other Ali, one do Hats Makuridan the Kakulikalun Shale. Bengalur Hatatrai, okay. Chamra Nagaralu is in order. Okay. A Uber teacher with that. Uber teacher, a large group. Yella classical Sela Kaskur. Our another absent other Shale Bandu. Yet, Bangalore city will get no Kelon schools there. Ali, like you know, Mundaninda, Ete Targeti, the Kay than the Kalkur. Otherly, bring the Moor, you know, Shikshakar. Our Shikshakaru, you know, Moor Moor class and Tovatare. Oh no, Uber teacher held as Runam get one do war the lay almost on do most subject have got Bakusa. One teacher other lay more than a shikshakar, over another absent other. Over Melbera. Yellow over Melbera. Our job there is very pata maro the land. Other Jotege, registry Barioso. Sarkar in the Nazo Patra Mandra the Kino respond model or training program on the Hogodo. Estundu administrative work and the Lavala Tumber. Midday meals were at midday meals Norbeco, midday meal or cook Bandida Rail one Norbeco, Mata the Kena, Ella Samagir Tandida Rail other Norbeco. So, a shikshakara job there is Tumane Rabbakari. Makkal Kadame, but Wobrech Shikshakaro, Eladan, Uro, Tripur, Norko, Tumane Kalasai. So, either Bagan of study Madazi, Eli is to Kadame enrollment active. Purthinam Karnatan and Uruze, Sarkari Prathamika Shale, first in the first place. I was the percentage of Shale Gale, very Ipatai Kinta Kadame Makida. Wow. Median enrollment and Tarala. No, Median right. enrollment is 25. Tumba Dodda Shale and Re, Tumane Dodda, right. Innu students. Are they new Kasagi Shale and Mordre? Kasagi Shale Lester Tare, one on the class Alipa Mordre. Okay, one on the school alone there, no one the Earth Sara Mursara at the letter. Estonian teachers at Tare, or a Beres Alater, PT teacher at Tare, music teacher at Tare, either the Pratun subject get very very. Uh, math book teacher with the English kin of Brukanada Kibro of Bru. Arthur a subject wise teacher soon a master Kari Shalegali. So, Mata or Untra Doda Nyaya, 
राज्य सरकार केंद्र सरकार मत इन ट्रैबल वेलफेर शादी अदर बेल स्टडी मत हाँ फील्ड स्टडी हो चामराज नगर हो मैसूर होगी बंगलूर ग्रामांतर बंगलूर सिटी वे बेरे बेरे शाले होंगे अली एनरोलमेंट एस्ट नोटी अद्वन डीटेल रिपोर्ट अद्वर बे बर सूपर ओके सो अदर बे मेन मेसेज सरकारी शाले मकलू प्राइवेट शाले हाँ सरकारी शाले शिक्षक अद्विद्र इंपारटेंटिया प्रॉब्लम सरकार अड्रेस इन सण साले शाले मकल पर् क्लास एनरोलमेंट चेन इन कर्नाटक कर्नाटक के पी एस कर्नाटक पब्ली हनर्डने स्कूल जस्ट लाइक प्राइवेट स्कूल सो आता मकल एनरोल फस्ट स्टैंडर्ड कल हनर्डने तरगति ट्वेल्थ मुगियो तनक अदे स्कूल अद्विद्र मध्य ड्रॉप आगो चांस कड़म इन बरी ईदने तरगति तनक आर एंट आम इन आर ड्रॉप आगेशन अरबार् चेना शाले कड़मे बट पूर्ति पूर्ति प्राइवेट स्कूल सौलभ्यूरकुशली you also moved to social sciences mm-hmm. uh e transition uh, uh, very interesting ekane na idu unconventional andre samanyavagi ee tara areas switch maadu thumba kashta yaradru ee tara kelsa maadbeku andre ee phd ne maadbeku anta alla physics alli but aa tara transition maadbekandre yav riti avaru training irbeku yav tara yoshne maadbeku adu helidre kelavaru idu kelthina avarge फस्ट आफ्ल मन तगी नमील बउंड्री अंतर गोडेल ट्रेनिंग भौतशास्त्री बेरे फील हमारा ग्रउंड लेवल प्रतियो फील बेसिकेक्निकेस्टर इंटरेस्ट अदरलू प्रति वार अग्रोटूरी वारक आर 
ಡಿವೋಟ್ ಮಾಡಿ ಅದ್ರ ಬಗ್ಗೆ ನಾನು ಕಲಿತೀನಿ ಅದ್ರ ಬಗ್ಗೆ ಅದನ್ನ ಇಂಪ್ಲಿಮೆಂಟ್ ಮಾಡ್ತೀನಿ ಅದನ್ನ ಪ್ರತಿ ವಾರ ಮಾಡ್ತೀನಿ ಈ ತುಂಬಾನೇ ಇಂಪಾರ್ಟೆಂಟ್ ಪಾಯಿಂಟ್ ನೀವು ಹೇಳ್ತಾ ಇರೋದು ಯಾಕಂದ್ರೆ ಈ ತರ ನಾಲೆಜ್ ಅಕ್ಯುಮುಲೇಟ್ ಮಾಡ್ಬೇಕು ಅಂದ್ರೆ ತುಂಬಾನೇ ಒಳ್ಳೆ ಮ್ಯಾರಥಾನ್ ಒಂದ್ ದಿನ ಹತ್ತು ಗಂಟೆ ಕೆಲಸ ಮಾಡಿದ್ರೆ ಸೊ ಮ್ಯಾರಥಾನ್ ಮಾಡ್ಬೇಕು ಅದು ಟೈಮ್ ತಗೊಳುತ್ತೆ ಬಟ್ ಟೈಮ್ ಇನ್ವೆಸ್ಟ್ ಮಾಡ್ಬೇಕು ಇನ್ವೆಸ್ಟ್ ಮಾಡ್ಬೇಕು fabulous you this is uh, we switch back uh, to to english <laughs> because uh, uh, a lot of people who probably cannot understand kannada we had a kind of a elaborate discussion on two elements one is uh, the uh, kind of work what she would us other one was to, uh, to 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 look at what kind of uh, inclination and uh, motivations i had also background uh, studies one needs to do if one needs to uh, switch any into any particular area especially social sciences mm-hmm. so uh, the last segment uh, shivu is to just ask you about uh, your inspirations in terms of any kind of reading or music or anything which motivates you to keep yourself sane <laughs> and also to also inspire you to to do the work what you do uh, because it's a fascinating thing what you are doing in terms of the transition what you have already done mm-hmm. and uh, it also has a direct element of impact mm-hmm. on on people which is a, which something uh, sometimes we mm-hmm. don't uh, kind of recognize um, that is a reason why social science is such so important also mm-hmm. in that sense mm-hmm. could you tell us what really motivates you in terms mm-hmm. of uh, uh, the external things what you do uh, apart from your work mm-hmm. which will be nice for our yeah. listeners yeah my main thing after coming back to india is like you know understand india indians nice yes. and it has been a process of discovery of india really? and i love to travel really? and i love to travel to more remote places, places. you know nice. and one of my hobby like especially trekking oh. it's kind of exposed me to the remoteness of india and the beauty of it so so I, what do you do when you go there do you study something or you just, just casually go as a tour, tour, nee, traveler but i usually have some background about no, that place, place yeah, of know. course yeah so let's say if i'm studying uttarakhand you know i've studied a lot about indian states yes yeah, yeah okay but the thing is reading in a book and actually Going seeing there, them is totally different totally. you know so i went to himachal pradesh yeah. you, know, you can look at the different type of languages that they speak the community yeah. yeah. their practices you know it is fascinating yeah, yeah. okay so and let's say i went to nagaland you know i wow. learned so much about uh, naga tribes you know oh. highest linguistic diversity is there in nagaland and arunachal pradesh but when you go and see there and you see their tribal community every mm. districts you know you see there are different tribal communities that this thing you know and they don't look like the imagined tribal people yeah, they exactly. wear formal <laughs> dress <and laughs> <laughs> exactly that is a stereotype which uh, people have to go away from yeah, yeah. so those stereotypes you know yeah. will go away if you go there uh, you know? yeah the travel is one thing which keeps me grounded yeah. and uh, learning about people's people's history like community history yeah, yeah, nice, like you know nice. uh like one is political history is something you know we yeah, all read, read yeah. but going beyond that you know what do people do communities what nice. kind of food they nice. eat you know so is trying out local cuisine and if there is a little history associated with it and why people are doing it. so everything you know kind of fascinates Fascinate. me a lot you know? fantastic and uh, my travel interest is something which drives me a lot nice. and with that i see people right and then you interact with all kinds of people you go to a small restaurants you know and uh, like not a high end yeah, one is yeah. one then you start talking to people you know and then i went to kashmir recently nice, nice. so kashmir great lakes right? there i interacted with tribal group you know the their life is very nomadic you know i had studied about them with the first time i got to know nice, them nice. you know i saw that during winter time when there is high snow they come down nice. they are all shepherds <laughs> so that kind of gives a close touch nice. you know? wonderful yeah. wonderful fabulous that fabulous. one yeah That's wonderful wonderful shiv in fact it's been a pleasure uh, interacting with you we almost have spent uh, close to you know more than 2 hours now <laughs> we have we've spoken on various different elements about the fascinating phase transition <laughs> of you from uh, a physicist to a quantitative social scientist Mm-hmm. and it is a lesson for a lot of people who are interested in such kind of uh, transitions and uh, i wish you all the best for your uh, ventures and uh, fascinating work and uh, i i keep reading a lot of things what you have written it's very motivating to also learn a lot of things 
and also there is an element of physicist in you <laughs> which is very heartening for people uh, who are seeing this work uh, gaining some kind of quantitative new point mm-hmm. and uh, therefore it uh, brings in a new perspective also to some old problems mm-hmm. and uh, old perspective to new problems <laughs> in, in, in that sense so all the best for your future ventures yeah. Oh, yeah. and i'm extremely thankful that you could spend uh, this uh, this time with us mm-hmm. yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Pawan, for inviting. I think it was uh, kind of opened up from my it, life from beginning yes, to the present. Yes, yeah. Now it also helped me reflect on my own. Yes, yes. Yeah, and it's uh, been wonderful talking to you. And also, we are connected from almost more than twenty five yeah, years. Yeah, twenty five. Easily, twenty five years. Easily. Easily. So. Yeah. In fact, I first met Shivu when I was in eleventh uh, standard. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. That is yeah. when uh, we had our first uh, mm-hmm. interaction. and as always she has been uh, very uh, generous and also uh, very thought provoking in fact like, that is something i have no hesitation in telling about uh, she and he continues to actually you know motivate a lot of us and inspire us to do very uh, good work thank you she thank you very thanks much thanks a lot yeah thank you very yeah. much so this is pratidwari where we try to humanize science mm-hmm. and this time if i am a physicist who transformed into a social scientist shiv kumar jolat